It's a fun surprise sometimes. Okay. You ready? I call the meeting to order. Good evening and welcome to the December 4th, 2023 uh, study session of the Ashland City Council. We will start this evening with public input and I have speaker request forms. I have six of them, I believe. One, two, three. Yes. Yes. So we will give each person um, two and a half minutes during the 15 minute time frame, and we will start with Tam Mazden and Anna Marie LeBeau. I hope I said that correctly. So are, are they here? Okay, so, so what you'll do is you'll come up to the two microphones and please give us your name and the city in which you reside. Dana will help us with the chimes when you have uh, 20 seconds left of your two minutes and 30 seconds, she'll give you a single chime and when the time is up, she'll give you a double chime. Okay, go ahead. Cool. Um, my name is Tam Mazden. I live here in Ashland. Uh, you know, I don't fully know the intention of this meeting or tomorrow, all the logistics. I just know that there's a lot on my heart right now and that is my intention to share in my time. <coughs> I lived in Ashland for seven years and went to Arizona. I've just recently returned. And upon returning, I heard a lot about the challenges increasing on the streets for our friends who are hungry or who need to feel at peace at night while, while they rest. I feel um, extremely passionate about humanity and us caring for one another. I also know the magic of Ashland, and I know that you guys know it too. And I know that we are called here for a specific reason. And for the most part, we all want healing and we all wanna get along with each other. And I, I believe in Ashland, I believe in you guys, I believe in what's possible. I believe of the changes that can occur, just tiny changes too to really shift and feel more like a win-win-win across the board for everybody. So I just want to invite you guys to stay connected to your heart and to humanity and to basic kindness. I'm not saying that you aren't already there. I'm just saying that it's winter and it's cold outside and brothers and sisters having trouble sleeping and resting can shift quickly and we can do something about that. I know that Ashland has done some changes since I've returned and I'm grateful and I'm excited for even more and I will be back tomorrow night to use my voice. Thank you. Thank you. Anna Marie LeBeau. She's not here right now. Uh, she's here. I can put her to the bottom of the pile and see if she's back by the time that, uh, that we get there. Let's go to Joseph Wise and then uh, Karen. So Joseph, you'll have two and a half minutes and Dana will give you a single chime when you have about 20 seconds left and a double chime when your time is done. Okay. Thank you. Well, where do I start? I came from Maui about three months ago after the big fire that destroyed the bear part of the island. I remember I used to, I did a movie here many years ago and I remember the place was nice and that's all I was looking for when I came here was just a nice place. And it's got the greatest people I've ever met. Kind, generous and helpful. But uh, the uh, bureaucracy in the, the police station and, and whatnot just seems to have a, somewhere in its uh, command structure, just somebody with just the meanest attitude I've ever seen. I mean, uh, 
just today, I, I asked the officers, when they picture what they, their personal picture of themselves, do they see somebody being cruel to cripples and war vets and the elderly for little or no reason? I mean, the only reason they give me is that they got a memo or a picture from some person who has a nice, soft, cushy place to sleep. And I wonder if their bulletproof vest has got stuff for pictures and memos. The reasons they give us are just uh, from uh, the command structure above. You got to get out in the freezing cold and the risk frostbite and lots of pain because I got a memo this morning that some person looked out their window or some person drove by and didn't like where they put us. And we have no place else to go because they've taken away every place. They tell us we got to come here. And I mean, it's the, the police force, they don't seem to communicate with each other. One officer will tell us one thing, next thing another officer will come out and get everybody tickets for following those instructions. Officers will talk to us another day, and the officers the next day say that those officers never existed. There's no consistency, there's no communication between the ranks. I mean, uh, this, this morning, due to an uh, unfortunate attack brought on by them not paying attention, I it was a uh, I guess you said I was in bad psychological stress this morning. And I asked for the uh, legally mandated bit of a, uh, I guess you'd call it the mercy. Because I know if, if they're not allowed to force things if it causes mental or physical harm and health and all that. And they said, well, we're just following the orders. Which uh, seems like a fine excuse, except for you realize that's what the Nazis used in Nuremberg. So when they're making an old man crawl out of his tent in the ice-cold frost, with his amputation burning in extreme pain, one starts wondering, who is giving these orders? I mean, there is a point when one just got to realize there's cruelty and there's evil in the world, no matter how big of a smile and pretty face you put on it. We are not criminals. We've just lost everything due to misfortune. And here but for the grace of God go thee. Thank you, Mr. Wise. Next, we have Karen and Rick Bevel. Hi, I'm Karen. Um, I'm homeless out here, too. Karen, and if you can get in a little closer to that mic so we can hear you. Every day, we have to get up early in the morning and move. We're not allowed to put our tents up anymore, and we're freezing. There are people that are going to die out here if something isn't done. And I have a suggestion. Put a fence up right there. It's a security fence. Well, not a security fence, but a privacy fence. Out of sight, out of mind. Then we're safe, and so are you. And so are the people around us. We're not out to hurt anybody. We're out there just to survive and try and get back on our feet. And some of us may never. But there are some of us who are trying really, really hard. I have a 14-year-old daughter who's relying on me. But I can't charge my phone. So it's completely dead. I can't even call the courts. I can't talk to her. I'm stuck until I can find a way to fix this. Do you know how hard it is when you're on foot and you're blind? And yes, I am going blind. I am blind in my left eye and I am going blind in my right. And I have no out. You say, go to the shelters, go to the urban campground. The urban campground, you know what that does? Do you know what, how much illness is there right now? How many people are sick? How many people have COVID, the flu, influenza, <laughs> hepatitis B? There's also black mold in those tents. I'm not going there. I have emphysema, I have asthma, and I have COPD. I will not breathe that crap. Sorry for the language, but I won't. 
I'm asking for just a little help, you know, a little more space. Stop making us move every day. I've been in renal failure for almost a year. All we want is a little help. Thank you. Rick Bevel, and then Debbie Nicewander. Either uh, one is fine. Y'all know me. I mean, I've been on these streets eight years now, and I'm still the way I am. And I push myself harder than you'll ever see any person like me. But I get in trouble for it. I get tickets for it, rushing me. But they don't care. I mean, it troubles my heart because when I first came here, every cop I met, I showed respect. I waved at them all. They waved back at me. Some of them said, aren't you going to wave at me? Oh, I'm sorry, I can see it. I felt more love in this town than I've ever felt in my entire life. I was raised over the mountains in Climate Falls. But here, things have changed, and it's not good. And if you, all you want us to do is die, then you don't have to worry about it. But there's other people behind us, and they're worse. Because this world ain't getting no better. Rick, can you get in a little closer oh. to the microphone? I want to make sure we can hear you properly. Excuse me. I'm shy. <laughs> no, this town has made me change. So when I came here, people I met, more love than I've ever known in my life. And ain't even my real family, because I don't have any more. But the people I know out here, like I said, you all know me. You've seen me move, you've seen me walk. In a wheelchair, on a bicycle, crippled and walking. More pain than you probably ever felt in your entire life. And I'm getting pushed harder to move faster. If I don't, I get ticketed. That's money I don't, can't afford to spend. And picking them tents up every day, that's cruel. That is cruelty to humanity. Because you're treating us like your underlings. We don't deserve anything. But we do deserve something that everybody does, love and respect. I got it all. But I can't take this crap anymore. Because at times I'd much rather be dead, because then you don't have to worry about me and I don't have to worry about the ridicule and the and what happens to me, you know, the tickets and all that. My past is my past, but my future's been bright ever since I've been here. I just know that everybody I've met in my life here, I love and I respect fully, 100%. All I say is God bless y'all think about us, because eventually we are going to die out here. I've known a few in eight years I've been here that are frozen to death outside. And this is the other crap that's going on in this world. I'm not the same as them. I'm, I'm not going to brag about myself, but I'm a very damn good person anymore. I can give you anything I have if I have it. And if I have to suffer, because I've been suffering all my life, from childhood to now. When's it ever going to stop? I'd much rather be beaten than talked to the way I've been talked to or treated. And I was definitely beat as a kid. But God bless y'all. Thank you. <laughs> Debbie Nicewander, and then uh, Austin Kunzelman. Debbie, you're up. Uh, Anna Marie, or, yes, Anna Marie, go ahead and come up. Hello. 
Um, I came into Chuck. I haven't been in this community for, for very long. Um, I've been here about two weeks. Um, um, if you can get in close to that microphone. Yes, I can. Is that better? Yes. Um, you know, since I've been here, I've traveled around a lot. And um, this, this that's facing your town isn't something that's going to go away. It's going to get worse and worse. People are freezing. We pro to live in a tent during winter. I don't know if you've ever any of you have ever done that. Um, to basic barely make your basic needs, but then have to pick up your entire camp and move it every day, twice a day. Most of these people who stay here are disabled and over the age of 40. There's not a lot of other people. We are all the same people here. The rats are insane. I'm going to send videos. I don't know. I'm going to get some information. Um, I've done some activism over the in the different country, you know, and this just doesn't seem right. I mean, there has to be a solution. Uh, the dignity that's taken away. The, most people out here are barely even making it, struggling mentally. A lot of people have mental disorders. They can't get their meds. They can't get their meds filled. They can't get to the doctor. They don't have rides. All kinds of things. There's so many things, you know. So when you look out there at the people, and I know that the homeless population, you know, um, some may think it's a free ride or that people are lazy, but there's a lot of di different individuals out here from different walks of life. Um, I just think that there can be a better solution. Moving these tents every day is not physically, we can't do that physically twice a day. Um, the more colder it gets, the more gear that we have. That is a lot for most people. I mean, Rick only has one leg. I mean, you know, and when the cops come over here and are screaming and yelling at people and calling them names, it just, it's heartbreaking to me. And I'm gonna be in this community because, and that's why I'm here, you know, I have a story as well as a lot of the other folks here, but um, you know, I'm here rebuilding my life and doing a lot of really great things. I just think this is a beautiful community and I see the love and care from a lot of people that come by and they see us, they drop us off gear, you know, things like that. But we all take care of each other out here too. And I just think that, um, especially with the rats and the trash, uh, it, it's just not a good situation and I think it could really get out of control very quickly. I've witnessed this in different cities. The rats get so bad where the homeless people live. I mean, these are real things that are gonna happen. Um, tent cities are popping up all over the United States. This isn't just a new thing. I think that if, I don't know what the solution is, but I know it's not this. And I think that people would be very much more agreeable and willing to work with any of you um, if, if there was just a little bit of lead way, you know, a little bit more room for people to, to lead, you know, to just live their normal days. I mean, we're not a bunch of kids down here. This isn't fun for anyone. It, it's really terrible and it's very sad. You know, we walk each other through each day and help each other. Um, a lot of us only have people here. This is our community of friends that we, and that we love and that we take care of, you know. So I don't know, just maybe we can think of something that's way more positive and that could have a better outcome. There's no housing here. Um, so that's kind of a step, you know, if, if we take this situation and we turn it into something where there are steps for people, I think that would really help people to have maybe some more hope. But thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Debbie Nicewander and Austin Konzelman. What a tough night. It's been a tough couple of days. Sunday morning, a fellow from the night lawn. I don't know the situation. Decided to take a knife and go through tents. Four different tents four different folks were assaulted and their tents slashed to pieces. One individual in his tent got thrown about in his tent. He came out and was able to chase this fellow away. Yesterday was Sunday, no bus service. We know this person is still in town. We know either he's off his meds 
on drugs he's in crisis we know that so yesterday was a total state of fear all their gear it rained that night everybody is drenched in their gear their tents are destroyed and this person is still out there well come to find out he ended up trying to break into a hotel last night and apparently was shot at by the owner and ended up in jail he was released around 11:30. the police when we filed a report or when we thought we filed a report we called them they came out interviewed apparently they didn't take a official report but um, so and they didn't know who the fellow was we ended up having two individuals with the same name on the lawn they were thinking it was a different individual well this fella showed up this afternoon as I was leaving the night lawn I've been taking people down to get in gear to replace tents and gear he shows back up I had to call 911 and I had to drive my car in between the two groups to hold the peace until the police came. This individual was contacted with the police. There were no charges filed because the police think there's no report being filed, but he did end up taken away in an ambulance and self-committed himself. So now he's in on a mental health hold. What happens after that? We have no say of who's on that night lawn. We should have a say in who's excluded and who's on. Before, back in the day, before the police got involved, Ms. Dicewander, we took care of things up. ourselves. And we need to be able to be a part of the process on the lawn. So I just want to fill you in. This is state created danger. You made the night lawn. You took on the liability. You need to really think about next steps Thank you. and consequences. Thank you, Ms. Nicewander. Have a good night and sleep well. Austin Consulman. Good evening, Council. My name is Austin Consulman. I'm a resident here of Ashland. I've been more involved with the night lawn and returning back what the community has given to me trying to do good for all the misdeeds that have been happening. Um, I wanted to bring your guys' attention to your commitment to the community, statement to the community, and two bullet points that reflect in recent events that I feel the council has not been upholding. Commitment to defend civil human rights for every person regardless race, origin, religion, gender, sex, or economic stature. Our determination to pursue and protect, provide a agenda that ensures that can turn, that ensures that can turn to government for protection without fear or recrimination. These individuals on the night lawn, especially someone like Rick, who I've been assisting, because he's gotten four tickets in less than three weeks for prohibited camping. He's on SSI, SSDI. Do you think he can afford to pay these tickets because he can't get off the lawn if I'm sick or uh, I can't be there to help him or no one's there to help him? Come, come on. Do you think that is fair for someone who is barely moving around in this cold weather, for someone who's senior, to be able, do you think, to pay these tickets? I think that's cruel and a violation of the Eighth Amendment. Ladies and gentlemen, I really hope with these new ordinances and Christmas coming up, you look really deep into your hearts and put yourself in their shoes and just feel the cold and feel how they feel when they get a ticket or the weather hits them in the morning. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next uh, agenda item is the water utility rates overview. So good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm Scott Fleury, the Public Works Director, and I apologize in advance, but I do have a couple slides to walk through um, for the group. 
and for everyone watching, let's see if we can get this started. So I'm here to talk tonight about utility rates uh, for water, but also the other enterprises, specifically storm drain, wastewater, and transportation. And we're going to start with water, and I just wanted to kind of do a quick overview on what your utility rate for water pays for for the city. Um, we have 19 and a half full-time employees in the water division. We have hundreds of miles of underground pipe. We have our storage systems. We have Rita Reservoir, Hostler Dam, and we're regulated by the Oregon Health Authority and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission for the Hostler Dam Project. So this covers your maintenance and operations, your utility rates cover your maintenance operations, the personnel cost, and then also your capital cost for that system itself. Now, um, we just recently had Hansford Economic um, do a water rate projection for us for a six year period. Uh, this accounts for the existing budget uh, that we have for the current biennium and also our capital costs, uh, including the water treatment plant. And what she's projecting is 10% rate increases uh, for the planning period in that six year window to generate the revenue requirement necessary um, to maintain your infrastructure, pay your people costs, and satisfy the requirements for the capital infrastructure program that the council previously adopted. Um, as you see from the graph, this is what a single family residential utility bill would look like using a thousand cubic feet of water monthly. So this is kind of our standard metric that we apply when looking at averages for the water utility. About 46% of the revenue requirement is recovered in your base charge. So your customer charge and your meter charge. The other 53% is covered in the commodity charge capture. So the tiers one, two, three, four, and five um, that are laid out in the water rate structure itself. So this is, I will say this, this is a snapshot in time um, with looking at projected increases in the future bienniums to develop what that rate increase, but also looking at the exact theoretical expenditures for this current biennium to meet that revenue requirement, to meet the policy requirements in the fund, and to make sure that we have enough uh, cash to meet our debt service requirements that we have in place, and capturing enough revenue to make sure that we have enough to pay the debt service for projected capital projects in the future. The uh, cost or the water rate study um, technical memo that's in your packet details uh, what projects the city should use cash on out of our existing ending fund balance reserves and what we should uh, continue to look for debt for. Um, and primarily when we're talking about debt for the water utility, we're talking about the water treatment plant project. That's the biggest driver of the rates moving forward for the next few years. Uh, Hansford recommends using a bunch of the cash on hand to cover our, uh, some of our water line projects, the pump station projects, and some of our smaller projects that we have in the capital improvement program. So just an update on the water treatment plant project. Uh, we're currently at 90% design. HDR uh, plans to finish up by the end of this year. And we're setting kind of a winter spring bid schedule. So February, March, would, we would bid the project uh, with the expectation to start construction in summer of 24. And you're looking at about a 30 month window for complete construction and about another six months of startup for the plant project itself. Uh, finance staff, myself, uh, the city's financial advisor, PFM, and bond council are coordinating right now with the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, on funding the project through their Water Infrastructure Financing and Innovation Act, as we've spoken about previously. Um, some of the things that have changed since we first started going down this road for WIFIA funding is uh, we were able to uh, match in kind to allow WIFIA and the EPA to fund the complete project. Um, that's because we have cost match uh, we provided for the engineering work done today, but also the land value that we're using that's a city owned parcel. So previously we had talked about WIFIA would loan us 80% of the project total and we'd have to find an alternate source for the other 20%. 
well, now that we have enough in-kind match, we meet the 20% requirement. So um, with that being said, WIPIA will loan us a maximum award based on our in-kind of $75 million. <clears throat> now, when we brought this forward to council a couple years ago, based on that 80-20 funding package, you know, we estimated the construction and that 80% at about $40 million. The city council authorized a borrowing resolution at that amount. Now, in order to close the loan and meet the financial obligations, uh, the request will be to update that authorization re resolution for borrowing. Um, and in speaking with the financial advisors and finance staff and bond council, their recommendation is to set it at the maximum amount that the EPA will loan you for this project so we don't have to do these process steps again um, as part of that. And just a reminder that when you get these loans in place, you only spend what you need to satisfy the project. So you're not obligated for that full amount. You only reimburse what you spend towards the construction and construction administration phase. We're also working on finalizing the master bond declaration. And the master bond declaration is basically the playing rules for how the city will acquire future water debt um, for projects, and that's something that bond council attorneys are working on, our financial advisors, uh, finance staff, and legal all have a hand in developing this. So they're working to finalize that. Um, we're coordinating with the EPA, and the expectation, if we get through the process steps over the next couple months, we would be able to close the loan for the construction construction administration phase in May of next year. Um, as part of that process, which aligns generally with the construction start date of summer in 24. The other thing that staff is continuing to work on is uh, searching and applying for grant funding opportunities to offset. It won't cover the full project cost, not from what we've seen, but it will help offset some of the costs. So just an example, we applied for nine, a little over $9 million in bill money for um, money that the state was given for emerging contaminants. So the city of Ashland is listed as a community um, on the state's website for emerging contaminants, specifically algal toxins within re reservoir. So the state has been granted some bill authorization dollars to help support funding projects. So we applied for that grant funding. I spoke with uh, infrastructure finance authority representatives a couple weeks ago about additional grant funding, and they're also looking at having additional bill funding um, that we could apply for with about 50% loan forgiveness with a maximum amount uh, granted of $6 million in a loan with about what we would be looking at is about $3 million in grant forgiveness. So there's another opportunity. Um, I'm coordinating right now with Evan Brooks Associates, who you may remember is our grant kind of advisor and consultant firm about the potential for going after a FEMA a Building Resilient Infrastructure Community Grant to help offset some of the cost as well. Um, so there's some grant opportunities in play that we're trying to run to ground as part of this overall process. And as information develops, I'll get that to the council um, as I know it moving forward. So we've had discussions um, previously and some of you um, have seen it and it's in your packet and been a, a privy to it before, but uh, we did a cost of water service in 2016 and this looked at the rate structure itself. Um, this looked at charging for the customer classes and making sure that everything was charged equitably across the system for the customer classes and how everything broke down um, in order to recoup your revenue requirement that you need to support the water fund. So the recommendation as part of the rate analysis was to update that cost of service. And I know the council, uh, some members were looking at uh, making it a more progressive structure. And there's some ideas that you can look at as part of that. You know, do we want to capture more of the revenue requirement in the commodity charge? As I said, you know, it's about 47.53. Do we want to see the commodity charge take more and then the higher tiers take more? You know, that's also part of a conservation effort, you know, and your rate structure to protect your water supply is part of that. So the recommendation is to refresh that uh, cost of service study and then make sure that it's equitable across all the classes. 
and make sure that it aligns with the council policy and goals as part of that um, moving forward. So if the council is interested in having that work done, we do have money in our professional services line in the water fund to move that forward. I expect, depending on how intensive it could be, that cost could be about fifty to $75,000 to develop that full cost of service study. Now, moving on to the wastewater utility, you know, we have 13.8 FTE that manage the treatment system and the collection system. And again, uh, you know, hundreds of miles of pipe, lift station, manholes, telemetry, the wastewater treatment plant, that all gets covered in the utility rate for the city. That is regulated by the Department of Environmental Quality. Again, I get to say it, I'm super excited through the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System permit, MPDS permit. So that's what we're obligated to meet for discharge into Bear Creek and how we manage the system. So that really drives some of the capital and maintenance related improvements that are done at the wastewater treatment plant. The rate study and the financial analysis was done as part of the 2022 collection system master plan that looked at the rate structure for both collections, but also for treatment. And for fiscal year 25, the recommendation is to have a 6% increase. Um, you know, and as a reminder, uh, there hasn't been a rate increase in any of the enterprise funds except for storm drain in, in 21 since 2019. Um, so we've been quite a few years without a rate increase. And as we've seen, you know, construction cost indexing has been pretty significant over the last few years. And we also have personnel costs that have gone up and are projected to go up as part of that. Um, so what I did when I looked at these rates is I just took for the affordability analysis I'll get to in a minute is what the projection was for fiscal year 25 other than the water rate, which is recommended to increase uh, in fiscal year 24 and in fiscal year 25 as part of that overall recommendation. So the, again, this is what a single family residential bill would look like um, using the maximum essentially commodity charge established uh, for wastewater utility for the community. Now, real briefly, the storm drain, kind of the smallest of the divisions, four and a half FTE, uh, the piping system, the manholes, the outfalls, and we're regulated again by the Department of Environmental Quality through an MS4 permit, which is a municipally separated storm sewer. So in some locations, your wastewater and storm drain are commingled. Um, we have a separate facility, and so they're regulated differently as part of an overall process. <coughs> The 2019 uh, Storm Drain Master Plan uh, did the financial analysis uh, and the recommendation to meet the revenue requirements based on the expectation of spending within that fund uh, puts the rate increase at about a 7% um, adjustment for FY25. And again, this is what a single family residential rate would look like for the storm drain fee. Now we've had conversations uh, previously about establishing a level of affordability metric um, in order to make decisions uh, from the policy standpoint about rate increases. Uh, we had that discussion that generally good budgeting practice is to put six to 10% of your median income aside for your utility bills. And so what I did, uh, this is the current status. I calculated and we had all of the average utility bills for single family residential. So the storm drain, the street utility fee, wastewater, water. Um, I received the information from electric on what that average was. We also added in, you know, your internet charge, your trash charge monthly basis. And uh, I did an estimate based on some information I found for natural gas as part of that overall utility charge. So in the current state, we're at about 6.6% of the monthly median income, and that's a 2021 census data monthly income, which is also the monthly income that Catherine Hansford used in her water rate calculation to show you where the water rates align um, versus the median income. So this is where we're at currently, three, about $351 a month at 6.6%. Now, applying the rates that are projected 
um, within the master plans or the rate study um, and not accounting for what could happen in electric or AFN or ecology natural gas. Those are all the current rates that we have. These are the 2023-24 projected rate increases. So you go from that 6.6% of your median income to 6.8% overall um, as a metric. And this is just you know, something to noodle for the council to see where we lay out as part of the overall structure um, for our rates. The other thing that Hansford did is look at our low-income senior um, assistance programs for our utilities. And she reviewed, uh, we have a senior um, low-income resolution that was developed in 1992 that hasn't been updated since. So I asked her to look at that and make some general recommendations that we can look to and improve that program um, overall for the community. So she's made a couple recommendations um, the potential to lower or eliminate the age threshold within the program and just make it for low income, period. Uh, change the income level threshold against the poverty level, which I think the recommendation I uh, discussed with Eileen Glatt from the senior services coordinator position was about 150% of the poverty level was a good marker to look at based on her discussions with people that she helps through the senior assistance program. Uh, and in order to do any changes, of course, we'd have to update a resolution or multiple resolutions. Hansford recommends breaking the resolutions into separate entities as part of the overall program. And then that would also trigger a code update to section 14, um, especially if the council so chose to eliminate the senior component and just made it low income and qualifying at that range. So there's some resolution and code work that would need to be done as part of that program. And really with that, I know the council will have questions and some discussions, so. <laughs> yeah, I have lots of questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Kaplan, let's have you start with your first question. My first question, so I gotta pick one of my questions. <laughs> yes. Well, um, okay, I'll just pick one other question. There's a, I have actually, a, I have a question of just, a question of clarification on one of your data, but I don't, but I don't want to spend that question on, on here. <laughs> we'll come back as many times as we need to. Okay, uh, so I'll, I'll save that question because I have a question, a question about one of your numbers. Um, but my, my question, Scott, has to do with the subject that you know is very near and dear to my heart, it has to do with our rate structure and the progressiveness of our rate structure. And I'd like, I, I very much appreciate that you've already started um, you know, going down that road to, to look at what that would take. Um, um, you know, with a, with a uh, cost of services study or, or what we could, might be able to do in the meantime. But I guess on this specific thing, on this specific 10% increase uh, that's being proposed over the time, I wonder, and this is just a study session, this is not what's coming back to us for actual approval. Um, I wonder if we could get some options, because I'd like to see a little bit of progressive um, pricing in there as well. If there's a way to, as you said, there's 47% of the cost is on the base charge, the two customer service, the service charge and the customer charge, and then 53% is on the commodity charge, the rate per cubic foot consumed. I wonder what it might be to have a differential charge different apply the the cost increase differentially across the base versus the, the commodity and then hit those higher con those higher rate tiers uh more than the base rate, rate tier because i really don't like I, I like to keep the base tier minimum cons uh, amount of water consumed as uh, as inexpensive as possible we probably will need to have some increases but you know a 10 percent is is uh, feels a little harsh uh, so I'd like to see if we can put more of it on the on the higher tiers, and as you said, it also um, um, hits uh, our, our conservation executives. And then I wonder if there are any other charges that might be added into the mix. For example, uh, you know, I've been thinking about people that have private swimming pools. Is there money to be raised by putting a flat charge on on private swimming pools? Private swimming pools take a you know fair bit of water, um, and um, uh, you know. I wonder how much revenue might be raised uh, in, in that way as well. So to answer the swimming pool question, that would be something that we would make as part of the cost of service study, sure. the analysis. I don't think that that's something that staff can handle 
prior to bringing a resolution forward to for sure. council. Um, but I think, uh, so you have to think of this is that recommendation 10% is across the meter charge, the customer charge, and all the tiers within the structure to generate the revenue requirement necessary to support the fund. So the important thing is the revenue requirement. Um, how you get there can be moved around. So uh, you, I think that there's something, and Bryn is here, and I'm not going to throw her totally under the bus, but she's helping me um, collect some data so that we can look at um, how much is being captured in each one of the tiers. Because it could be a mechanism where the base and meter charge go at 3%. Um, tier one of the commodity charge is 3% or even 0%. And then tier two is 5%. Tier three is 10%. Tier four is 20%. Tier five is 50% higher in order to capture that commodity charge. So there's some ability to impact that uh, by looking at some of our historic data. And I think we can do that on the staff level before doing a full cost of service study that would formalize that and look at multiple years worth of data and go, okay, moving forward, you know, in order to meet these projected revenue requirements in this analysis and based on the usage and the category in the tiers, this is where your rates will be applied moving forward. And that's what you want to, is you want to create that defensible rate structure uh, for the council and the community as part of that overall process. Great. So I understand that you can look at that before we come back so we can have some, a couple of options on the table perhaps. Yeah, I have a spreadsheet that's like a mile long right now that Bryn sent me to start to put some of that together so we can try to capture that and look at the 2022 data as that baseline, Great. Um, which we have all the final numbers for, so Great. yeah. Thanks, thanks Scott, that's my first question. <laughs> Councilor Blue. Thank you, Mayor. I uh, joked with my wife when I was preparing for this that uh, I don't need to do too much because I'm sure Councilor Kaplan has most of the questions that I would ask anyways in there. Um, I understand that, that you know part of these rate increases is, is about being able to fund the new water treatment plant. Has any work been done to see, let's say we remove the water treatment plant completely, what would the rate increases need to be to keep up with cost of services? Not removing that project, but I will tell you in the long term, it would be a pretty significant reduction overall. Um, but you have to balance that on the huge expense that you would have to put into the existing treatment plant for that time frame. So there's a removal of one cost, but there's an addition of another cost. Um, and then uh, you have to look at the life cycle of that cost um, as almost sinking um, and not recouping it into a new facility or structure that has a longer lifespan. So there would have to be some analysis to look at that offset and then also to, for the uh, policy body to make that decision of wanting to move forward with that offset or not move forward with that offset. Thank you. Follow up real quick to that, to that to same that. question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, of course, everybody, I'm sure you, you as well, are disappointed that, you know, a lot of grant money didn't come through to, to, to purchase that. I think that was certainly the hope uh, when it was, you know, included in the CIP. I mean, I'm curious what it would look like uh, for us to wait on approval of, of, of getting a bond for this until we could see what kind of grants would be coming in. I mean, my understanding is if it's in the CIP, we can begin to apply for grants. Um, and then we can make a determination whether it's worth moving forward on the yeah. water plan. And I should uh, have some information on the bill EC that we applied for um, pretty, pretty rapidly. We applied for that a few months ago. Um, and we would know most likely in spring, summer for the additional um, IFA funding bill money, that $6 million with $3 million of forgiveness is part of that. We would know that. Uh, any sort of FEMA brick process was probably a year out before you would know that um, as part of that grant funding opportunity. Uh, so there's some time gap in there, um, but not a significant amount. I mean, just a reminder too, that the EPA funding for the program is about the best you can get as far as term. 
because um, it allows you to have a 35-year term, and you're not going to see that through other funding mechanisms. Um, part of the impact that you see in the rate increases, which will change, I'm hoping for the better, is that the interest rates are driving a significant increase to what was previously projected using that funding source. Uh, and we've seen interest rates uh, and the basis points start to trend down over the last few weeks. So if that continues in the positive direction, that will also impact that rate increase um, moving forward, especially in the future years as far as a projection. Um, the other thing that I briefly mentioned at the last meeting is we have a dam safety improvement project um, that's in the CIP for almost six and a half million dollars. Well, um, there's been some new information come to light through our comprehensive assessment process that m might relegate that project to not being needed to be delivered. Um, but I can't make that decision. That's a city council decision that you will have to make on your level of risk that you want to apply to the preservation of the dam project. I'm hoping to have that CA report wrapped up. By the end of the month, we're going to have an interim meeting with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission in February to go over all of the components of that comprehensive assessment um, because it's a regulatory requirement by FERC that we do that project. But now that project falls into the acceptable risk category um, for their comprehensive assessment program. Doesn't mean that they're going to let us out of it potentially, but we do have some leverage and some discussion that we'll need to have as part of what we want to produce moving forward for the dam um, and us raising that left and right abutment um, as part of an overall. So there could be some cost savings there as part of that project, which would then also adjust your rates moving forward. Um, so I, when I say this is a snapshot at time, you know, these rate analysis and this has to be updated every biennium um, because you're going to use your true expense and revenue for that biennium and then what you project that you're going to spend in the following biennium um, as part of your budget process. So these are always living things. Um, we're just grabbing them at one shot in time. And if we collect more revenue than we expected, then that's a rate adjustment. If we don't collect enough, that's a rate adjustment. Councillor Hyatt. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Scott, thank you. Um, I wouldn't want Bryn to come out tonight and not have a chance to hang out with us. So I have a couple <laughs> questions that probably are best directed to Bryn. Um, but my, my first question, I'll give you a chance to get there, my friend. In reviewing the appendix that went through the statewide plans and how they're administered, whether they're 185% of the state median income, or, I'm sorry, 60% of the state median income or 185% of um, federal uh, guidelines. And then looking at those and then looking at Corvallis, and Corvallis looks at it more from the perspective of is the applicant um, leveraging things like SNAP, free lunch program, OHP, TANF, ERDC, um, employment related daycare. Um, and I'm curious from a utility billing perspective, if using a system similar to Corvallis would be both effic uh, efficient and effective for our staff and also rather than putting so many if you are this age, then you get that, but you only get it for three months and it's capped at this. If it simplifies things across the board for helping folks and for administering the program. Right now, if a individual or a household has SNAP benefits, they automatically qualify. Mm. Okay. Yes. So that's probably a case where in the resolution, since the resolution's 30 plus years old, we didn't see that or know about that element. The reasoning is because um, we trust that they have gone through that approval process and Absolutely. Our, and our the the income requirements mm -hmm. are falls within what theirs is. So that's how we've teamed up with that to where when folks do submit that, we automatically qualify. But yes, that makes it 
a much smoother, quicker mm -hmm. process as far as reviewing applications when we do receive that paperwork. Mm -hmm. So would it be safe to draw the conclusion that when this body works to act on the recommendation provided in here for assistance programs, that we should look to codify when we repeal one resolution, replace with something that's more in the current decade, mm -hmm. um, and do it in a way where we're codifying if you're on SNAP, you're automatically, and perhaps consider some of these other programs like OHP, ERDC, TANF, and the like for the same reasons. Exactly. exactly. Okay. Yes. Okay. So that's not an outrageous request? Not an outrageous request, no. One quick follow up? Sure. So given that we would no longer be going by our metric of age and percentage, and by going in that direction, do we perceive that we would be opening up the qualifications in a way that we may not currently be budgeted to support? Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you do pursue that path, um, the age, like, like Scott was mentioning, that Hansford uh, recommended removing the age. Mm -hmm. Um, and unfortunately, right now, we have no way of knowing the what full, would come in the full impact. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Bryn. Sure. You're Thank you, Scott. And just you know, clarification too: the storm drain is not in that resolution, but there's a credit applied to that. So there is, mm -hmm. you know, just fundamental cleanup that needs to occur, continuing the baseline program itself. So Scott, I have a question. The the six years that's plotted out in our in our materials here, um, what do we think happens after that six year? Um, is there? I, I realize that the the crystal ball gets much fuzzier Fuzzy. at that point, but we also realize that we're paying over a multiple decade time scale for the the new water treatment facility. What what might we expect? Are we, are we doing this this sharper climb so we can level out on some level? Uh, that's part of it. So in the study too, we looked at um, there. Are, she's looking at your existing debt load and paying off. So in the next few years, there's a few hundred thousand dollars in existing debt that get paid off. In the 2030s, there's some more debt that gets paid off. So you'll have existing debt, um, but you're also going to lose some of that debt load that you have for the utility itself, which will offset your cost overall. Um, it just depends on where you are um, with your capital and infrastructure needs. Um, one of the things that she's always uh, recommends, and you see this, is to make sure that you carry a fairly high cash balance for your utility, especially while you have some of these high-profile capital projects going on. So once they're completed, um, there'll be kind of... I expect the recommendation is that you won't have to carry such a high capital um, balance for the utility as well. So these rate projections ensure that you have enough cash moving forward for the next six years. Um, and as we do the projects and we remove some debt, I don't foresee the rate impacts to be um, this substantial. They more align with your people and materials cost increases um, because a majority of your capital infrastructure then just falls down to replacing some of the underground pipeline um, within the system. As you bought the big expense already that's going to be managed for the next 100, 150 years. Councillor Duquesne. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you both. You're very informative. You know a lot about this. I appreciate it. Um, my question about this is, Councillor Kaplan said it's not going to come back in front of us, but I think it is in January. Is that correct? The expectation is either uh, the first meeting, the first true meeting in January 16th, uh, or the first meeting in February to bring back uh, specifically the water rate resolution. Um, my expectation would be to bring back the rate resolutions for storm drain, streets, and wastewater in the May-June time frame for approval for enactment starting July 1 for fiscal year 2025. And, can I follow up? Yes. Thank you. So, um, 
in looking at your presentation and reading what's in the packet, what I heard a lot of was water treatment plant, full-time employees, and capital improvement projects, and the word bond, and who's paying for that, the rate payers, the people who live here in Ashland. And my thought about this is, is that when this comes back in front of us in January, I cannot support a 10% increase when I look at people who are rent burden and food insecurities, and it's so many people here in Ashland. I don't know where this money is anticipated to come from because people are tapped out and can't afford hardly to live here now. So when this does come back in January, I won't be supporting this. Um, I believe if anything is over 2% in rates, it should go to the residents of Ashland and let them vote on it and see if they can afford it. Councillor Hansen. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you both very much. Um, I'm curious when we're, we're talking about total costs in the past, we've, we've often um, had aspirational goals of, of, of big grant money. Um, do you have an update on any kind of upcoming grants? Because when I, when I look at these big numbers, I'm wondering if there's infrastructure money that will help bring it down. For instance, the, the solar construction cost might be offset by the 30% federal ITC that's coming as a cash grant. For there, municipalities? For, for yeah. municipalities. I'm yeah. curious, are there any other big whales out there that, that we're going after? You know, the, ne the next biggest one would be the FEMA BRIC grant. Um, which I don't know the exact specifics, but they have a pretty big pool of funding for that program itself, um, which we would go after. Um, we've talked about the Odo grant for the photovoltaic system um, and other grant opportunities for the battery backup system potentially um, as part of that structure to reduce the cost of those systems. Um, one of the things that we have talked about is, you know, those, uh, will be all adds into the bid package and when the council reviews and uh, makes a choice on the construction phase you can choose to have those at that time or wait and do them at a future time because they're designed into the system so they can be constructed at a future date um, if we so choose based on grant money and availability and chasing grants for those things um, so that's why I say there's kind of a, a short game and a long game in searching for grants because, you know, uh, a, a lot of people I've spoken to, you know, will have money available potentially in the future um, that could offset your cost since we're going to be in a three-year construction window. Uh, so that Bill EC money I referenced, the $10 million for the pretreatment and ozone system, um, we might not get it this go-around but it's four more years of availability for that um, as part of it. And they will let us go after that to offset that cost. Uh, the one thing that I want to be clear with as part of the rate structure is when we go after um, the IFA money, specifically that $6 million or even the Bill EC money, and to have that grant forgiveness, that principal forgiveness in the package, uh, you have to have your rate at a certain level, which is 1.25% of the median income. So right now we're under that. If you, so in order to be eligible for that funding, you have to be at that 1.25% or higher to get that grant forgiveness package as part of any other future loan documents. Okay, and that, that's not part of this prospectus that we have in here right now, because we have a more padding in here with our with our 10%. With the 10%, that's that. correct. And, and I guess if one more, uh, yeah, it, I'm wondering like w when, when that when the calendar timeline, um, when the clock runs out, um, in terms of pulling the lever on on which a la carte items and or like really looking at what this package is going to be, and to Councillor DeCane's point, you know, in terms of voting on it, um, when do you? anticipate that you'd have a better idea of monies that we'd be able to bring in with the rate structure and Councilor Kaplan's request that it sounds like can be done in-house. Do you think we're going to be able to look at a more, this is great, but I'm wondering as we get closer to spring, summer, if we'll have another bite at the apple here to like really kind of 
sharpen our pencils and see if we can get that number from 10% down to something else to meet all these requirements. So there's gonna be a couple takes at that. You know, we'll know about some of the funding moving forward um, that we've already applied for or will apply for. The LOI for the $6 million is due in January and it usually takes them a couple months to rank and prioritize that. So hopefully we would know that. We would know the bill EC already by then. And then you're gonna know the big one, which is the actual construction cost of the project. If we put it out to bid, you know, we expect to have April, May that bid back um, and review of that bid and bring it forward to council. That cost, as you saw in your uh, packet, you know, has a high and low opinion of 70 million to a low of 55 million. Um, right now, the rates are based on the $70 million cost um, to be more conservative. So if it comes in under and we get more grant funding and we have capital project expenditures, you know, that future rate projection will uh, be reduced. And then there's the concept of do you want that amortized uh, as a steady rate increase or do you want those are policy decisions too. Do we want a higher one, a lower one, a higher one, a lower one? Because you can blend the rate structure and your uh, use of cash over that kind of six year window to accommodate that. Uh, the other thing that we're gonna know more about is the rate stabilization fund as part of the water treatment plant project. So we have a pretty significant ending fund balance. And one of the things we've talked about is taking some of that ending fund balance and putting it in a dedicated line and holding it uh, for what they call a rate stabilization fund. So um, as you do your rate projections, you know that this cash is available and specifically tied to this project. And that's part of that master bond declaration and the funding with the WIFIA program that gets all tied into those documents. Um, so that's one of the things that finance staff, the financial advisors and bond council attorneys are discussing right now about that mechanism because they have the rate forecast. So they're also using that information with the existing to kind of develop that full financial plan that gets wrapped up as part of that whole document process. Wow, okay, thanks. And <laughs> in addition to this, the, the federal rates might go down. There's all these other things that are happening. Yeah, if we see the interest rates, you know, we were originally projecting at about 3.5%. Uh, well, the latest iteration, I think they're at 4.7%. So on $70 million over 35 years, that's a pretty significant increase um, in interest payments. Thank you. Councilor Kaplan? Um, yeah, well, actually, uh, my other, my, some other questions were answered in this go-round, but I would like to just to follow up on Councillor Hyatt's line on the, uh, um, the, the subsidies. Um, that's, I'm just trying to get a sense of the time frame. If we're talking about water. I'm, a LEAP also applies to electricity and the others, and I I'd, I'd look at these things as in you know, a whole package. Uh, and I'd like the same simplification of just looking at these federal programs, state and federal programs, uh, and then also just spreading it throughout the year. I've always I've, I felt that it made some sense to apply the elite program to the winter when there was winter, you know, heating costs. These days, the costs are, are going throughout the year a little bit more. So even perhaps a slightly s smaller monthly um, subsidy assist discount but spread throughout the year might be a, a, a more appropriate thing. So are, we gonna, are you gonna be able to bring that back to us um, perhaps in the time frame of this next uh, uh, several months? And so, we, so it's in the rate, stud, rate program for May when we look at the rates next? Is that when we look at rates for the, for the next fiscal year? So we have not done any analysis on the LEAP no. side. Um, and I don't know if, with Tom back here, if this is a something that he is looking into also yet, but we sure with your direction can pursue looking into um, a different program methodology if you would like us to. Yeah, uh, I would like to. I'd like to see if there's other counselors <laughs> would join me on that. Just to follow up to that, I think the timing would be, we could definitely start that analysis now, but without a kind of budget supplemental, this would be something we'd look to incorporate in our next budget cycle because as Bren mentioned, it could have a significant impact on how much um, relief we're offering, which is gonna need significant 
dollars to address. So if I understand what you're saying, we could do the analysis now and understand what the impact would be, and then we decide in the, in, for the next uh, fiscal year whether that's something that's budgeted within our budget or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it looks like I'm seeing head nods to investigate this. Mm -hmm. That looks right. Great. And I also just wanted to follow back up from Councilor Kaplan's earlier um, request around the progressive rate structure. That will be more than two hours. <laughs> In spite of your giant spreadsheet you already have going. Uh, is there general agreement that this council would like to look at, at the, those progressive rates? Yes. Okay. So, uh, uh, Councilor Bloom. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'll be quick because we kind of just went through and th those are two big issues for me. And, and I mean, I'll just say right now that I'm not comfortable voting on increasing rates in January before we do any of these, looking at the rate structure, looking at these programs, um, because things change. And sometimes there's not, you know, follow, you know, council could change and they could decide, nope, we're going to keep raising rates and we're not going to look at a progressive rate structure. So I'd like to see those things in place before voting on increasing rates. Um, and I mean, just anecdotally, I can tell you right now, looking at the numbers, there's no way I can pay my bills if they go up that much. Mm. So something to consider. Mm -hmm. So I have a question about, um, about the, the uh, rate stabilization potential with our ending fund balance. Is it possible to stabilize rates for specific segments of our community from that ending fund balance? Or does it have to be in that structure spread evenly across the different tiers? So from the, what you're asking is the uh, charges for single family versus multifamily versus governmental versus commercial I'm actually talking about the lower income element. Could we could we move some of that funding in to offset this these increases over these next several years for our lowest income folks? By adjusting the program you are itself is how I view it. So allowing broader access and changing the income threshold, you are providing that. The key, I think, too, in that point is the cost of service and looking at, okay, if we want to keep the customer in meter charge and tier one as low as possible and recoup more. So that's that next phase, so to provide um, more equity to um, the, uh, the residential base or the customer base and that and charge more on the higher level of the commodity charge. So um, increasing access to the program and then recouping more of your revenue, and this is how I think about it, um, in the commodity charge um, protects that lower end rate payer by minimizing that rate overall. And then the rate stabilization fund protects all rate payers across the board for that portion of infrastructure and that borrowing. Okay, so I have a, a follow-up then to that. And in the conversations that I've had around conservation of both water and electricity, one of the things that has come up is that having more of the uh, revenue for a utility coming in from the commodity side can uh, create a perverse incentive to sell more of that commodity rather than to conserve it. And so I've, I understand that there are convert that part of increasing that base rate is to make sure that you can maintain your infrastructure in the system even though you're encouraging people to drive down their use. And so how, how should, what should we be thinking about in terms of that as we go through this conversation? Well, and I think that that's the balance you have to find as part of this analysis um, and what other communities do as part of that structure and where they found that balance um, is make sure that you get that revenue requirement um, overall, and whether that be in that split 40 60, 45 55, you, you know, where we would align to ensure. And that doesn't mean that you couldn't change that moving forward. So, if you had a couple years of data, you know, as part of the next biennium's analysis, and you're going, okay, well, our revenues were down um, because we changed our structure. Well, we, and are how we applied the rates across the board. Well, then we have to take that into account. Um, and I'll, there is also the other mechanic of reducing your capital expense. You know, do does the uh, council make the decision to not do 
um, X amount of capital each year um, and defer that into the future to offset that rate across the board as well. So there's a couple questions and discussion points that have to occur through time and during the budget process uh, for staff to align with that policy um, that the council puts forward and to bring back the information that ties it all together. Mm -hmm. Councilor Duquesne. Um, thank you. So kind of piggybacking on what you just said, Scott, is it to change the structure and something that was brought up earlier from Councilor Bloom um, about removing the water treatment plant. I believe a couple of years ago it was brought to my attention that the water treatment plant has life on it, existing life like 20 years or something. So maybe now it's like 18 years of life. I look at where the city of Ashland, where the residents are right now, and I just don't feel like some people don't have six to 10% of their income to put towards utilities. So to change the structure is there and for us to live within our means and move away the most costly thing in this, you know, the capital improvement project list is, you know, from here to the door. And to be able to look at removing some things so that it's affordable for the people of Ashland. I, I think this is all a wonderful uh, idea, but right now, I don't n know how people are going to be able to survive hit with a 10% increase. And this is just the water. I'm not talking about everything else. And so is, that, is there a possibility that we can look at what the cost would be removing that? Uh, there's some historic information that I provided council uh, last year or the year before on what the cost would be to maintain uh, the existing infrastructure for the 20 year, 25 year window versus the cost of construction of the new plant. Um, so that exists and it's been brought to council previously. So um, I can refresh that and send it out uh, to the group and make that as an attachment to the future rate discussion as part of that. So you have that historic knowledge. I, I appreciate that and I, I can probably look back and see if I can find that also. I just feel like now is not the time. In a year and a half, 19 businesses have closed in Ashland and we're not that big. So I, I think it would be good to be able for everyone to look at that. Councilor Hansen. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I'm, I'm curious, off the top of your head, I, I remember it, I got oriented with a different number for the water treatment plant, and not to throw you under the bus, but I'm curious because my, my memory's fuzzy. Do you remember off the top of your head how much useful life it's estimated that the fresh water treatment plant has left? So if you spend the money that's recommended when they did that analysis, and um, I think we were talking about 10 to $15 million over that 20, 25 year period, um, as far as a cost, and that wasn't adding in a pretreatment system for ozone. So that was just the straight cost to maintain the existing infrastructure uh, for that time frame. Adding in uh, ozone pretreatment at the existing location, I think, jumped that cost up to about $28 million um, when we looked at that kind of comparable. And that is in the information that we provided and there's a chart that shows the cost over time for the new plant versus maintaining the old plant. So, um, but those are the kind of numbers I remember from that chart and I can get that and, you know, send it to the council so you have that information. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'd take a, another look at that. My biggest concern, of course, is the cost of doing nothing puts us in, in, in peril and jeopardy of not having mm -hmm. water. You know, second to the the tap system, if we had a cat catastrophic failure up there due to, you know, earthquake, wildfire, you know, pick your catastrophe, um, it would be devastating. So the the investment seems seems to me, you know, even if rates went from si from sixty dollars a month to a hundred dollars a month over the next. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six years. That that seems to be the the jagged pill that we're looking at swallowing 
and from there it would possibly go down unless the bid comes back astronomically higher. Anywho, thank you for um, yeah. revisiting that. I'm, I'm curious what that data is going to show. Councillor Dale. Thank you so much, Mayor. It's complicated. I'm going to try and simplify it at least. I'm going to see if I can repeat some stuff back so that I understand it. And uh, the the objective here is to just to create a defensible rate structure that's fiscally sound into the future as far as possible while having affordability of rates for a critical service and helping those that need it the most. So if we use a median income of 60,000 and change based on the latest census that but but we have a fixed rate bill of about 300 and change dollars, 300 dollars to someone who to an income of $30,000 is way different from $300 to someone a month with an income of $90,000, okay? So is there, if I'm hearing you properly, one of the things that we can look into, first off, do we have a distribution, uh, a study or, or basically a snapshot of distribution of income levels throughout the city so that we could actually see and kind of dig deeper rather than just using a median income, which is kind of a pretty dull, Kind of tool, I would say. So what I'm looking for is something along the lines of, from a base structure, is there any way that we can look at? Uh, because all we're looking at is is removing all barriers except for income. Correct? I mean, we we look, you know, a uh, you know, senior dis, all of these other things. It's just a matter of income level, if peak, if peak, the affordability of a of a critical service. So. We can structure the rate. What I would be looking at is, is what is the minimum amount of CFM? I think you said it was a thousand that, like, say, a family would for would need just for essential services, and then tailor a new rate structure around that to make it as affordable as possible. Understanding what Mayor Graham was saying about a progressive rate structure moving up that might incentivize, but and then third, and in looking at a base structure that. Uh, that would uh, allow for some sort of credits to be able to afford that. And then the, the, finally, is this something that we could get back before voting on actual rate increases? Whew. Yeah. But I think it's necessary, I guess I would say. So uh, I'm sure that we can gather some level of income distribution based on census data and some information that planning has put together um, I just have that feeling um, that that data exists at some level. Uh, I don't have it. I'm not the keeper of it, so I'd have to track it down. But I think that that exists um, as part of available data set. Because that's how you'd reverse um, engineer back into what we would need to fund. Yeah, and, and part of that overall is looking at the expectation of knowing that information how much percentage of the community will then have access to the assistance program. And that will help us make some calculations on what that would look like um, based on using kind of that established uh, income level um, and access to the program itself. Um, so we could probably do some back of the napkin uh, calculations for that, knowing those two things. Um, and then I will say everything else really should, once we have that for this next discussion, should really be taken a, for taking account of in the cost of service study. Um, and let the expert walk through the process, develop recommendations for the structures, look at alternatives to how to accommodate meeting that revenue requirement. Um, knowing that we're gonna change this program, knowing that we're gonna have this much uh, more access to it um, and then put that program into place and monitor it and let that be the driver for the rate forecasting for the you know fourth biennium year and the sixth biennium year is part of that process okay. thank you councillor hyatt thank you mayor um scott more of a confirmation than a question as we have walked through a variety of permutations here this evening, we are looking at the most conservative version of numbers. So said another way, we are looking at the highest possible version of rates because that is what is most conservative. So the 10% is as high as we would go 
under the conservative view. With that in mind, we then have a series of levers. One, the current CIP and projects that potentially can come out to the tune of millions. Two, options on grants that if my mental math is correct are somewhere between nine and 15,000, sorry, nine and 15 million this year. So, so far we're up to 21 million between taking six million out of CIP and another 15 potential in grants if we hit the jackpot. Start crossing our fingers and toes. And we are working within a range of 55 to 70 million on the plant price. So it could be 21 off of 70, or it could be 21 off of 55. We don't know until they bid it in the spring. So what's coming before us tonight, I feel like if we were looking at this as a piece of pie, we're eating the crust first because we still have some narrowing to do. And with that narrowing, we can better understand, in addition to what Councillor Dale is requesting, just what it really means to the community. To effectively get there, we need four to six months is what I'm hearing. Am I, am I clear? Yeah, and so, you know, from that, if you read the, the technical memo, one of the things that she's doing in that rate forecasting is she's forecasting your expenses based on historic, um, which could change. They could go up or down, you know, based on your materials costs. She's forecasting debt service at a higher rate than typical just to protect the enterprise. So all of those things are subject to change. Our interest rate for the, the project is subject to change. The construction cost is subject to change. So there's a lot of dials that will spin a certain direction over the next few months. Thank you. Councillor Kaplan. And um, just following up on uh, Councillor Dale's uh, comment and summary, an excellent summary, about the 1,000 uh, cubic feet of water usage, that, that's a metric that's used for comparison across, uh, across uh, units. That's, that's that, doesn't, that doesn't correspond with Ashland's average water consumption, which is uh, somewhat low, um, somewhat lower than that. Um, but that, that, that's just a metric for the purpose of calculations. Yeah, as you remember last meeting, we talked about it, and the, uh, they calculated about 104 gallons per day per capita on the residential side. Um, for residential use. Um, I know our overall total burden is about 125 gallons per day per capita, but when you just look at the residential block, it reduces it to about 104 gallons per day per capita. So that's a lot. So, so those numbers on uh, uh, burden on a median household is also slightly less uh, because, of, because of that. And also that's one of the reasons to put, if we put more onto the commodity, then people have a bit more uh, opportunity to reduce water consumption um, through you know, a lot of the implements that the city already provides to do so, and therefore lower, lower their, their cost. And I just want to say as a reminder for the whole rate discussion, in order for us to be able to have access to some of these funding sources, you know, especially the IFA, you're looking at that 1.25% of the median income, which puts your rate at, I believe, 6671, I think is what Catherine calculated in the packet um, or in the technical memo. Um, so that puts you on that rate scale that opens up those grant forgiveness opportunities um, through alternate funding packages. And, and what's the, uh, can you explain the purpose for, why, why is that a requirement? Uh, that's something that the state has installed, you know, and we've been following that through our previous uh, loans that we've gotten through the Infrastructure Finance Authority, as, as the, those financial rate projections have been in line to keep it at that minimum threshold in order for the city to be a, uh, able to gain access to that grant forgiveness portion of state revolving fund loans. So the TAP project and pump station improvements we've done have all set that metric in those uh, finance documents that you will be eligible for that loan forgiveness if you have this certain level of uh, uh, utility burden um, as part of the rate overall. No, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna stop. Okay, so uh, I think we are 
um, we've, we've maybe completed our discussion. Uh, Scott, are you clear with the guidance from the council on those two elements? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of dials uh, that I will be adjusting uh, with Bryn and finance staff um, over the next coming months. I think the resolution work is pretty easy. It's understanding the financial dynamics of that um, moving forward and then letting some things fall into place so we gain better understanding on actuals moving forward. It's always a hard game to play when you're estimating yeah. uh, things moving forward because things can change. And that's why I say these are living documents that need to be updated on a regular basis to account for changes. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much, Scott. Thank you, Bryn. You're welcome. Thank you. So now we turn to the electric utility master plan. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor, Councilors. Thanks for your time tonight. I'm Tom McBartlett, Director of the Electric Utility. I'd like to introduce Martin Stoddard from Stoddard Power Services. He's going to give us a little update on where we're at on our master plan work and uh, answer some questions. And I'm hoping uh, via Zoom we have Zsa, Zsa Song and Jerry Witowski possibly. Are they on? Great. So they're, they're also part of the team at Stoddard that are, are working on this project for us. And I'll turn it over to Marty. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, as Tom said, I'm Martin Stoddard. I'm an electrical engineer with Stoddard Power Systems. I'm part oh, of a team. Mr. Stoddard, if you can get in a little closer oh, yeah, to that absolutely. microphone, the folks at home can hear you better that way. Absolutely. Thank you. Is this better? Yes. Okay. Try not to yell into it at this point then. Um, I'm part of a team that's working on your, your master plan, your electric system planning study. A uh, planning study involves looking at your entire electric infrastructure, and there, it, there's a lot of elements to it. What we've been asked to do is talk about a specific part of the, the study, which is specific to renewables. And so we'll talk a little bit about the plan and the, and the study that we're doing right now and where we're at on that. But we're going to focus mostly on trying to address any questions you have with regards to integration of renewable energy, which I think was one of the requests that you guys had for us on this study. And so we'll try to do that. One thing I will say is I, I would love it if you just ask questions as we go. Don't wait till the end because uh, we'll, you know, you'll forget your question or it may change in your mind. But go ahead and throw it out as we go and uh, we'll do the best we can to answer it. Um, we do have on the phone Jerry Witkowski and Zsa, Zsa Song, Dr. Song. Um, Jerry Witkowski has been working for the city of Ashland for 30 or 40 years. Uh, I've been working with you guys for about 20 years. Zsa, Zsa about 10 years. Um, so it's a real pleasure to be here and to see you guys. Uh, and thank you very much for the opportunity to be of service to the city. It's been wonderful. Um, as I said, I'm with uh, Star Power System. We're a small business up in, uh, in uh, Eugene. Um, we've been doing power system analysis and studies our entire careers. So that's, that is our focus is power systems. Primarily from Utility perspective, we do some development work as well, and I know some of the questions are probably going to be with regards to that. Um, we are about 40% complete with your study right now, and that's some of the legwork. There's a lot of things that goes into these studies, and so a lot of the focus has been on developing a, a model. I'll talk about it. We're changing the model. We've had a model of your system for a long time in a program called Easy Power. Um, there's a new system we're using that's GIS-based. It's much better for a utility-based system. The, the Easy Power model is a three-phase only model. It is non-GIS based. And so with a utility system, there's single phase loads. There's a lot more dynamics to a utility system that uh, the model we're building right now is, is very laser guided for. Uh, here are the specific things though that you guys requested. Opportunities and barriers for adding renewable energy resources. And what we'll talk mostly about is the ways and what are the impacts of adding these resources to the, distribu the distribution system, your distribution system and the difference between that and, say, a transmission system. Um, assessment of the city, city's readiness to accommodate high adoption of electric vehicles and fuel switching, specifically the reduction of natural gas, which turns into electric load on your electric infrastructure, and then recommendations for integration of the city's climate and energy action plan. We'll talk a little bit about that, you know, about the different options and opportunities for that. 
but that's a, a very big global um, um, goal. And so when you get to the specifics, that's when we can really talk about the impacts. When we talk about global, there's a lot of options, a lot of opportunities out there. So it's very hard to get down to, we will say brass tacks in terms of what it specifically you wanna to do to integrate renewable energy. Uh, here's a quick look at your, your city map. So the, the map you see on the left, that is our model that we're building right now. That's a Millsoft model, it's a GIS based model. You can, you can see it looks a lot like the, the system on the right. And so with that model, we'll be able to more readily do the feasibility analysis that we've done for you guys for a very long time. So you say, we wanna add a generation resource or a large load in a different location. We can then throw it into that model and see what the impacts will be on your load profile, on your voltage, power quality, things of that nature. And so that's part of the study is to develop that model. On the right, you know, I don't, I don't know how familiar you are with your system. You, you take service from three different substations. In the north, you have the Ashland substation. Um, there you take it in a regulated 12.47 kV is, is your service. So you are sharing resources with Pacific Weather. They own the substation, they own the regulators, the racks, you own the reclosers, and then take the feeders outside of that substation. Um, in the south, you have the Oaknell substation. That is also owned by Pacific Core. There, the city owns nothing inside the fence, and so you take the service right outside the fence. And so for years, that was a problem because if you had a problem on your feeders, you had to coordinate with Pacific, Pacific Core to lock out those feeders. And so a number of years ago, you installed reclosers outside the fence that you could control and they are coordinated with the interior breakers and reclosers. So now if you have a fault on your feeder, your recloser will trip first and you have full operational control over that. But it's a very different dynamic than owning a substation. You, you don't own anything inside the substation. You only own the distribution feeders outside of that, that substation. And then the last one, relatively central to the city, is Mountain Avenue substation. That one, um, uniquely, you do own the, the transformers now. You didn't for a very long time. And, and for the last two planning studies, you'll see the recommendation was buy that substation. Um, you have now purchased that substation. So you take service there at 115 kV and own the transformers and everything else in the substation. That gives you a couple of things. It gives you a lot of flexibility on what you can do with that substation. And as you transfer low, you'll see one of our recommendations will be, and has been in the past, to transfer load off of Ashland to Mountain Avenue, to the extent you can. There's only so much you can do. What that does for you is it avoids the transformation charges that Pacific Core charges when they own the transformer. When you own the transformer, those losses are your losses, and so you don't get charged for those losses. And so you'll see that being one of the recommendations. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the recommendations with regards to the, that. Uh, your so we have a question from Councilor yeah. Dale. Just a real quick question, I may have missed it. What was your KVA out of the Oak Knoll? Out of Oak Knoll? Um, I've, got a, I've got a graphic that shows the capacity of all three of them. Now, Oak Knoll, keep in mind, the graphic will show your load with respect to the transformer sizes, but there's other resources, PP&L feeders coming out of that substation as well. So I'm only going to look at what you are, are taking from PP&L. You'll see their sizes, but any capacity that's in there isn't yours to take, if, if you will. It belongs to Pacific Or. Good question. So I will cover that, and if, if I don't at that point, please let me know. Uh, here's the profile. This is what it looks like. So on the left, you see uh, your average mean temperature through the years. This is the last uh, 10 years or so. In the summer, you're running about 92 degrees Fahrenheit average mean. That's not a peak uh, temperature. In the winter, you're running about 25, 26 degrees Fahrenheit as an average mean in the, in the lowest month. Um, your population growth has been relatively slow, 0.72% um, right now. And your load profile has actually been pretty flat. You have not had uh, significant load growth. That's attributable to two things, uh, efficiency gains, reduce, reduction in usage, and also high increase in net metering. You have a number of PV, residential PVs that have been installed, so offsetting some of that load. So you're seeing some benefits of that just in, uh, in your load profile. You are a summer peaker, which is a common thing these days. Summer peakers are, are relative to irrigation sometimes, but you don't have a lot of irrigation load and air conditioning. So air conditioning load and irrigation is usually what causes a summer peak. Winter peaks are cold climates where they don't have a lot of, of air conditioning. Um, your profile changes significantly. You can see your summer profile, you have a single peak. Your winter profile, you have the classic dual peak, morning peak and evening peak, which is usually you know, turning on the heat in the, in the morning, also turning it on in the, in the evening. 
Um, all right, here is a look at your substation. So these are your, your peak demands at each substation. That is very hard for you to see, but the top left one is Ashland substation. What you can't see is the scale, but basically you can, you're averaging about 12 megawatts peak uh, at that substation. The one thing that's, that's confusing on these is sometimes you'll get a peak demand that looks very high, but oftentimes what that is is a reflection of a, a feeder that was transferred to that substation, so you're actually taking on another substation's load temporarily while there's an outage or something along those lines. But in general, you've got about eight megawatts of capacity, eight MBA capacity at Ashton substation available. At Mountain Avenue substation, it's about the same and about the same capacity. So between those two, you might think, well, that's, that's a fairly, fairly substantial margin of, of load. But it's not, because what you can see then is if you've got about 12 in Mountain Avenue and 12 at Ashland, if you had an outage of one of those substations during a peak condition, you don't have enough capacity to feed all of that load from one substation. So that was a, a result in the last study. Luckily, your, your load profile has not grown significantly, but you do have that situation, and that will be addressed in the, in the, the uh, uh, study report that uh, under contingency requirements, making sure that you have sufficient capacity at all times, there are times in the summer where you would not have one if you had a loss of a substation. Um, one possible solution to that you'll find is there is room and a, a rack to put in a second transformer at Mountain Avenue. Again, you own Mountain Avenue, and so uh, that would alleviate that concern. You'd have enough contingency between the two substations. Now, if you take a full substation outage, maybe a loss of transmission or something like that, you'd still be in the same situation, but at least you'd have additional capacity to take out one transformer from either substation. Councillor Hansen. Yeah. Uh, Martin, I have a question. Backing up a slide, what sure. are, what's our what's our average kilowatt hour energy usage? Um, kilowatt hour usage in 2022 was about 165 million, but average like as in uh, uh, monthly. Yeah, I know it's seasonal and it's it's hard to it's That's hard right. to capture it. So let's just go. Let's just look at it over over 365 days. What's our Kind of that, that is your kilowatt hours in uh, 365 days, about 165 million. If you look here, and that's, again, it would be easier if I could zoom in on that. Um, on the summer peak, you can kind of make out that your peak, total peak in the summer is 35 megawatts. Your total peak in the winter is about <laughs> 33 megawatts. So not much less than it is in the summer. Um, the other way to look at it, that would be the area under the graph of those two curves uh -huh. is your, your average kilowatt usage. So in the winter, you're probably using more than you are in the summer because you have a steeper peak in the summer. So you may have a higher demand, but your energy use in the winter is higher than it is in the summer, per these two graphs anyways. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And, and the average uh, daily use, would we just take that 166 million and divide it by 365? That would be spread across all 12 months, but it would look like it would probably be biased more towards winter. And that's, that's a really important, as we go through this presentation, I wanna make that very clear. We're gonna talk a lot about um, distributed generation, PV resources, things like that. I think there's a lot of confusion in the public about the difference between power and energy. There's a, there's a substantial difference. When we talk about PV and we talk about uh, integration of these resources, we always talk in megawatts. That's power. But what you really want out of it is energy. That's kilowatt hours. And so it's the integral of those. So something that can produce 10 megawatts for a minute doesn't produce enough energy to, to feed a house. And so you have to have both. You have to have the ability to have the capacity to, to meet the demand, the instantaneous demand, and the energy production to meet the energy demand. And the energy demand, of course, is, is over a period of, of days, you know, over the day. And, and so we'll like, talk about that more. Looks mm -hmm. like we use about 454 megawatt hours a day if you were to average over the whole year. My, my question back right now to the other graph is, mm -hmm. if we were to invest in the mountain substation, would we, would we be able to meet our 35 megawatts if we, if we added, like you were saying, if there's an empty rack? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so that, that 20 MVA um, capacity that you see right there is a, a force cooled capacity. And so when you look at your transformers, I, I'm going to go on a limb here. I assume you have a 12, 16, 20 there? I do. Okay, so your, your transformer right now is a 12, 16, 20, which means it's got a self-cooled rating of 12 MVA. 
and then the first set of fans kicks on, bumps it up to 16, and the second set bumps it up to 20. If you add another 12, 16, 20, exact same profile, you'd have a capacity of 40 megawatts. Oh, gotcha, okay. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. You'd have a, a self-cooled capacity of 32 and a force cooled of 40 megawatts, mm -hmm. or MV8. And that's another one, you know, like, trying to stay out of the, the electrical theory as much as we can. I'm gonna use megawatts and MVA interchangeably. They're not the same thing. MVA is really current capacity, and your, your stuff is sized on MVA. It's sized on the current capacity. But what we really are talking about here is energy, and energy is megawatt hours, kilowatt hours. So I'm gonna kind of throw those back and forth. If you know the difference and you're catching me on it, I apologize, I know I'm doing it, but it's just easier to talk megawatts. People like megawatts. They don't like MVA, they don't know what that is. So. <laughs> uh, all right, Climate Energy Action Plan. Uh, I don't need to tell you what this is. It, you guys developed it, so you, I'm sure you know exactly what it is. Uh, it's your goals for overall reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by 8% on average every year to 2050 and attain carbon neutrality. So um, that is your goal and that's your, your plan there. And then also to be ready for projected climate changes. Um, the focus of the electric department planning study is to attempt to prepare the electric infrastructure for the future demands and any other initiatives you have with regards to this plan. So we're looking at making your, your grid, your, your distribution system more resilient as much as we can or at least retain its resiliency. Let's keep that in mind too is your infrastructure is aging. They are all aging. Our, our country has very aging infrastructure. So in these plans, we're not only looking at increasing the robustness of it, but maintaining the robustness that you already have. Um, as they get older, you have to start thinking about that. And right now, as you guys have probably seen the impacts of uh, the pandemic, it's substantial on the electric industry. If you have to replace that transformer at Mountain Avenue substation, you're looking at about three years to get a new one. So that's, that's where they're at right now. And so if you want to add a second one, for example, if we went out for bid tomorrow, we could get one possibly in two years from three vendors, one in Argentina, one uh, and two domestic. Um, but the days of getting 10 bids on a transformer are largely gone right now, at least. We're in a period where they have so much demand that they aren't even bidding transformers, so. Councillor Hyatt? Yes. Thank you. Tom, I think this is probably gonna be more to you regarding the transformers specifically. We did give authority to the city manager for purchase of those given the inflation of the cost so they don't have to come back for every purchase because of the threshold given right. the cost inflation. And we have pre-purchased some to be ready for that that are on order? Uh, yeah, what that was focused on was distribution transformers. Okay, that we, different. The, yeah, the stuff, that we, this day-to-day -day stuff that all of a sudden became over that threshold because of inflation. Yeah. So that's why we came in for that authorization so we could just still purchase those the same way we always had day-to-day -day for normal operations. But it was that was just distribution transformers and some of the bigger three-phase transformers had really went up in price like the one at Tesla. You know, five years ago, I'd have bought that transformer for $40,000. It's 150000 now. Okay. That's why we came in for that separate authorization. The two different types of transformers, one on a distribution system, the other is inside of our yeah. power stations. Right. And the ones in the power stations are suffering from the same environmental, uh, economic environmental impacts, only to an even greater extent. That's right. Exactly. Got it. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for uh, the absolutely. clarity. No, absolutely. Yeah, they're... They're called class two power transformers, and there is a, probably a dozen manufacturers of them in the United States, um, but they're all booked capacity. And what's happening is a lot of companies are buying production slots without actually ordering a transformer just to reserve that production slot so they can get one built. Another thing to keep in mind on that in terms of power transformers is um, they also usually put escalation clauses in them. So you would prefer to be able to go out for a fixed bid and say, I'm on a transformer, what's the price? oftentimes they will have a requirement for escalation clauses because they don't know, you know, a lot of this is a disruption from, from the pandemic. It's also the war in Ukraine. So a lot of the core steel and stuff like that's been, been d interrupted. And so they're having a hard time focusing or, or forecasting what the, uh, the costs are gonna be. So they add escalation clauses to their, their bids. Um, but I digress, let's get back to the planning study. Um, so the, C the city's path is to transition to clean energy. Uh, the natural gas ban is, is one uh, initiative. I, I think that is still to be passed. Is that correct or is that? Uh, it's still in discussion. Still in discussion, okay. I, I know I'm from Eugene where it, it, you know, we, we're one of the others in the state right now that has gone through that. 
um, re increased renewable energy portfolio, and then electric vehicles. Electric vehicles, of course, you know that's that's the wave is coming. It's inevitable. It's, it's happening. We're seeing it, and so we'll talk a little bit about that and the impacts. It's surprising. It does have an impact for sure. Maybe not as much as you might think. Um, the capacity isn't as much as you might think it would be, and it depends on the types. The technologies for all of this have changed a lot, and uh, we've got some examples of studies we've done for you before some of the technology advances that we have today, and so I expect that's going to continue. I can't tell you what exactly technology will be tomorrow, but uh, it's impressive how uh, this part of our industry is, is advancing. Uh, maximize energy efficiency and reuse. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on that, but no question about it. The uh, bang for the buck energy efficiency is, and, and reduction is, uh, is an immediate gain. Um, support climate friendly land use and management. Reduce consumption of carbon intensive goods and services. Uh, actually, I'm not going to read through all these. You know these and lead by example. So if you have questions on those, I'd be asking you the questions on that, not, not the other way around. That's your study. Um, so some more of the transitions, you know, the, the goals for the transitions. Um, I don't think there's anything in there specific that we need to talk about other than Ashland's electric grid capacity may need to be upgraded to support the additional loads. It really depends on what specifically you want to do. I think what I want to do today is make sure you understand what limitations there are to integrating at a distribution level versus a transmission level and what the impacts of doing that are. So, and, and some of the costs. We certainly will talk about costs as much as we can. Um, here's the, the, a basic portfolio. Some of the things we'll talk about today, solar energy and, and photovoltaic, there'll be a lot of discussion about that. Hydropower, you do actually have hydro resource here, which I'm sure you're familiar with. We'll talk about that. Other sources, there are other resources in this area for sure, biomass, biogas, and geothermal, uh, worth discussing at least as part of your, your overall goals. Electric vehicles, and then of course, uh, last thing is the, the microgrid. What exactly is a microgrid? And we'll talk a little bit about some basic microgrids that you are currently engaged in. This is from your website. Um, this is a solar energy commercial and residential PV. So this is the growth from 2000 to 2017, um, different colors for uh, commercial versus residential. Um, one thing to note, it says on there, on the left you'll see it says capacity in kilowatts. Um, but that's not kilowatts, because if it was kilowatts, you'd wonder why is our capacity for commercial gone from high to low to high, because it's not actually kilowatts, it's energy. This is kilowatt hours. So again, that's that, that whole idea of, of demand or power versus energy. So these are your, your energy numbers. Uh, install capacity right now, you have about 1.28 megawatts of commercial and about 3.82 of residential for a total of about 5.1. Um, Mostly, you know, the, so that, that, that is the expected summer peak. With 5.1 megawatts of installed capacity, your expected summer peak is between 3.8 and 4 megawatts, assuming fixed axis stands with modern PV panels and, and based on your irradiance, the irradiance of, of Ashland. Um, we can talk a bit about that. You know, what we go through when we do a feasibility analysis, a uh, desire to put in a certain size and a location, what the impacts of that specific location are. But uh, there's a lot to that. Uh, if you're familiar with PV, you'll know there's a difference in the efficiency you get from a fixed axis versus a moving axis, the tracker type systems. Um, so there's different things that can be done. I will give a big example of one that we did recently, uh, a uh, RFP for a facility in Maui and some of the bids we got back. That was a much more advanced system as a PV slash battery energy storage system, a, a microgrid system is what they were going for. And we'll talk about what that looked like. So commercial and residential PV. For solar energy, less than or equal to 25 kilowatts, there are no barriers right now or issues in general. So basically, you have a very robust net metering program. If a customer wants to put on net metering and put on a PV system, uh, your electric department has a very good program for doing that. And, and the fruit of that is, is proven with the 500 meters you have right now in your, in your city. So you have a very robust system. However, it is worth knowing as you get more and more residential, even at 25, we say there's really no substantial barriers. That's not to say there's no impacts of that. You will see that right now. So if you see it's a bright and sunny day and you see a cloud coming, you can walk over to the electric department, watch your SCADA system and watch what happens as the cloud covers the city. It's going to have a dip. So some of the things, you know, you have substations that are, we'll call it a push-pull. Your, your demand is the pull. Your PV is the push, and as the push releases, the pull takes effect. 
there are devices in the substation to s assist with that, regulators, to bump it back up, but they're slow. They don't operate very quickly. So we were just talking about that before we came over here, that as you get more and more integration, more and more penetration, you're going to probably need to adjust some of those settings to the extent we can. But we do see in large systems that there can be a substantial impact. In the old days, you'd see the lights dim, of course, when you had these. We don't have very many incandescent lights anymore to see them dim, so what you'll see is flicker in the lights. But you'll know that's oftentimes a voltage sag, and it could be a voltage sag because the cloud just covered over all the PV. Large systems. So we see here we say that for, for solar energy or other renewables, 25 to 200 is getting into a more of a, a, of a larger system. That sounds very small. So you hear things like the small generation connection, interconnected requirements of BPA at 25 megawatts. So how is it that we're talking about all the way down to 200, we need to start working on feasibility analysis and impact studies with the electric department? Again, that's the difference between distributed distribution connections and, and transmission connections. On the distribution connection, you have to be considerate of the other customers and the power quality of those customers. And that size system, as small as 25 to 200, can start to have an impact. And so usually those are done through an analysis to make sure there's no impacts, a, a very short feasibility analysis. All right. Getting into large is greater than 200. Again, I, I said 25 meant 20 megawatts for BPA standard, but for a distribution system, it would be 200 kilowatts. And so when you start looking at large power generation, typically it's not feasible on a distribution level. It can be done with some caveats, and we'll talk about some of those caveats. So we'll talk about the feasibility we did previously that showed it wasn't feasible and what could be done to make it feasible in terms of larger systems. But generally, when we get into these levels, you're often talking about transmission connections. And that's for most generation, not just PV. Um, we are working with a company right now that's doing a biomass plant. And it's a 25 megawatt biomass plant. And it's a 115 kV transmission interconnect. They can't do it at the distribution level. There's not sufficient capacity on that distribution level to do it. So it would be a transmission interconnect. Um, right now, you would not be able to export power. Um, that would be, you don't have any kind of, a, of a, an agreement with BPA to do that. Uh, apparently, there is a, a contract in the works to allow you to up to a five megawatt. It could be either a five megawatt individual or five one megawatt um, PV systems. That would potentially allow for some export of power. Um, why that's important will become very clear here in a few minutes when I say, you know, export of power versus pure import. But that's, a, that's new. And that's, that's a reflection on somewhat of the, uh, the trend of the industry. There is a lot of attempt to make it more um, palatable to integrate large PV. Mm -hmm. One thing that people often think of is why? Why is it such an issue to integrate you know, five megawatts of PV or 20 megawatts or 100 megawatts. What is the concern of doing that? And that is a really big topic, you know, a big topic in terms of transmission reliability, in terms of NERC oversight, the regulatory requirements of our country. Um, the electric infrastructure is considered a critical infrastructure, and so there are substantial regulations on what has to be done. A generation provider has to have certain criteria met to be able to generate because when there's a disturbance, they have to stay online through the disturbance and support the disturbance. And so a lot goes into that. As we add more and more renewable, un uncontrollable, say, renewable um, resources, it really disturbs that reliability. And so you're seeing more and more restrictions and more and more regulations placed on inverter-based systems to make sure that we don't reduce the reliability of the grid. That's, that's it in a nutshell, but it's a much bigger topic than that. But when we talk about why are there barriers to integration, that, that's a lot of it. And right now, if you're trying to build a large PV system in Central Oregon, for example, there are so many developers of that right now that you enter into a cluster study. They don't even do individual studies anymore, not even individual to look at whether you would have an impact. They do a cluster study, look at the group of applicants and decide who can move to the next level and who cannot in their interconnect request. It's a very expensive process, but that's where we are right now is there's a lot of development, a lot of interest in this, um, but it's not as easy as you would like it to be, or as we'd, we'd all like it to be. And, and I'd say to some extent for good reason. We have a very reliable system. We rely on it every day, and uh, we want to maintain that reliability as we transition to renewable resources. All right.
Um, moving on, so an example, 2016, there was a request for a 10 megawatt solar power generation facility. The, how do you say that? Imperatrice. Imperatrice. I'll, I'll try, Imperatrice. <laughs> Property was under discussion. Um, and this was a desire to integrate it into at the distribution level. Now, what you see on the right, and it, again, it's hard to see, but you hopefully have a copy of this in front of you, is your load profile. And you can see how much it varies. We talked about some average loads earlier, but it varies substantially. And so what we found was it would be potentially feasible if it was split between two feeders, two substation connections, and it had to have some degree of, of curtailment because we couldn't export that power. I've got graphs that will show that in much more detail here in a second. Now, this is where I say the, the technology has advanced substantially. Now, a system that size would largely be done as, as a microgrid, but more important, a battery energy storage system. Mm -hmm. So with the additional 10 megawatt, let's say we put in a 1 megawatt average 24-hour battery system, that can be evened out so that you don't have the high peaks in the day. You can, you can with, you know, move or flatten the peak of it, and now you don't get into that export situation. It becomes much more controllable. Um, that, of course, adds cost. But that was not technology that was really available then. The battery technology today is advanced substantially, and uh, we're able to do much bigger battery systems. So here is some of those considerations. Daytime peak load for the feeder at Ashland 2002 is around 1 megawatt to 2 megawatts. So if you add 5 megawatts to that, you can already see that that feeder, you're well above that feeder plus uh, any other demand. Um, and there's the Mountain Avenue 3006. So here's what it looked like. This is what, this, these are some of uh, the graphs from the feasibility study back in, in those times. So what you see here is spring minimums, summer maximums, fall minimums, and winter maximums. And so one megawatt PV, five <coughs> megawatt PV, and 10 megawatt PV. This gives you some of the, the considerations in looking at PV integration. In the summer months, when you have the very high penetration, you get a situation that looks like, let's give an example here. So winter, or summer is that second to the left column. If you look at the very bottom with 10 megawatts of PV, the blue would have been, you know, it's, it's a wider, you got longer days, so it's a wider, high profile of generation. But you can see it can offset down into negative demand. And so that's where that battery can now flatten that further and make it so that it would just offset demand and only demand. Also notice over on the winter though, how much, the, the scales are hard to see in this slide, but mo hopefully if you have a copy in front of you, you can see how much smaller the profile is in winter months. The nature of being in the north, you know, it's not as bad for you as it is for us in Eugene, which is not nearly as bad as it is for Seattle. And so our winter summers, you know, the, the sun doesn't come around the horizon, the horizon very well. And so we don't get nearly as much generation in the summer months. All right, so here's another example. This is a more recent example. And, and there is a lot that goes into these. This is from an NREL. So if you are interested in, maybe you have a, a property and you say, well, we have so much acreage we could develop on in this location. You can go on NREL and there are tools to say, okay, what if we use a, a fixed axis? What if we use a, a moving axis? What if we add different things? And it'll give you rough budgetary numbers. What I would say then is, in that process of development, if there is a, an, a, a, a project to do that, that's the starting point. That gives rough budgetary numbers of what it would cost. So in this case, we've put in a 4.8 megawatt AC capacity. You can see it's got a DC capacity of 5.6 megawatts. And so one thing I, want, I, I regret as I was driving up here, I realized that we did here, is you notice it says total module area is 7.9 acres. All of this is based on module area, not land area. So um, the land area is about four times that estimated. So you're talking about closer to, um, to 32, what is that, six, 32 uh, acres total land surface to put in a 4.8 megawatt PV system. Um, price per acre, about 1.56 million. Uh, that's acre again of module area, so. And in terms of how much that would feed, um, 66 homes, about 37 kilowatt hours. Again, these are rough numbers. You can, you can go on and, and look up, you know, 1,500 square foot house, 2,000 square foot, get a lot of different numbers. But as a decent rule of thumb, a 1,500 square foot home 
is about 37 kilowatt hours per day. And so for one acre of module area, it's about 66 homes. So divide that by four for one acre of land area. And that's kind of what you're looking at. Price, about 12 cents per kilowatt over the LCOE, over the lifetime cost of the energy. Um, that number is, is higher than your current energy costs. So here's where I'll talk about the other study we did, the recent study we did. That study was in Maui, all right? And that system was a 20 megawatt PV system with two megawatt battery storage system. In Maui, the energy cost is over 40 cents a kilowatt hour. So you can see the, the, the buyback, the, the return on investment is substantial there. It was not for the same um, goals. What it was for was to, this is for an agricultural facility. They had the land, so they already had the land to put it on, so they had enough uh, area to, to install it. But it was really to shore up their power quality and reduce their energy costs. And so we put together an RFP package for them, went out for bid. And here we left it wide open. We said, okay, it can be fixed, it could be tracker, it could be DC coupled, it could be AC coupled. Um, we left it wide open. We just said it just has to have these energy requirements, peak energy of 20 megawatts, battery storage of 2 megawatts over a 24-hour period. Go and see what we get. We got 13 bids on it and with a wide range of technologies and and. Um, costs. Uh, we got batteries for lithium ion batteries, we got flow cell batteries, we learned a tremendous amount. And, and my point being is, if you get to that stage, I would say leave it open and you know, shortlist it and have those developers come. You'll, you'll learn a lot from those technologies just by having them come and say, okay, here's what our technology is. And better yet, have somebody knowledgeable to ask the questions. Because what you'll find is like the flow cell, as a battery, it's got a lot of great opportunities. It's not lithium ion, so you don't have the, the rare metals as much, but it's a lot bigger and it's a lot more maintenance. All right, so those are some of the trade-offs you get on it. In fact, in that specific bid for the flow cell, the bidder, as part of their bid package, had full on-site, full-time on-site support for the battery alone. So an on-site person to maintain the battery 24, 24 hours a day, but working 40 hours a week just to maintain the flow cell value. So you learn what the differences are in those technologies. In the end, the price for that system was about um, average, well, average, I shouldn't say average, the lower, the winning bidders were down in the $30 million range. About 50% of the PV cost was battery cost. And so that's just rough order numbers. So where I give you a number here of, you know, our estimate is about 11 million to put in a five megawatt system if you add enough battery storage to really flatten out that power production, you can add about five million to that and call it about 16 million. And that's just a rough order of magnitude. Again, it depends on a lot of things. Um, and that's estimating, NRL is estimating land cost in this. That $30 million I gave you was without land, without any infrastructure improvements. They were tying into an existing 24.9 kV system. Um, they had the land already. So does that help a little bit, kind of give you some rough numbers? Uh, it was my understanding you guys want to see a little bit about those kinds of costs, but that's what you're talking about. Okay, okay. moving on to other resources. Hydropower. Um, you have a hydro resource, and it's one that we know quite a bit about. Um, we've been working with this facility for quite a few years. The generator in this facility is 845 kVA. Unfortunately, uh, years ago when the, the penstock replacement was done, there was a reduction in output, and the penstock wasn't really designed for power generation. It has some turns in it, and it has some restrictions that reduce the capacity of, of your hydropower plant. Um, that is unfortunate, but you still are producing, you know, 250 kilowatts capable, and you can see in this profile down here below, um, you were averaging at least 200 kilowatts, if not 250 kilowatts, continuously for the operation of that. Um, one nice thing about hydro is, one, it's generally storable, two, it has terrific capacity factor. And this is where I'm going to get back to that whole power versus energy. PV capacity factor on average is going to be about 10%. Hydro can be as much as 40 or 50%, in this case even more. I mean, you can see if, if we had the flow, the water, you could run that thing up to 845 kVA and just run it continuously. Um, and so as one consideration in, in your initiative, I would say it might be worth looking at increasing the capacity of Reader Gulch Hydro. 
um, you already have the infrastructure, you already own all of this, and it is completely renewable electricity. Um, and, and there are some substantial investments that need to be made, unfortunately. We, we were just talking about the PLCs that were put in that. Everything that was done in that was done kind of on a shoestring, on a very low budget. And uh, we used some very inexpensive PLCs that apparently had a life cycle of about 15 years, and they are 15 years old. So uh, they are starting to fail, unfortunately. Um, that, that is a relatively low cost compared to building a hydro facility to, to replace those controls, but uh, some work is going to need, need to be done in the short term to get that back up and operating. All right. Other resources, biomass. There's a number of biomass plants in this area. Um, you have one right up here, uh, well, one at Southern Oregon University. Um, the expansion at Rogue Valley, I believe that's a, a, looks, from what I can tell, like a hog fuel plant. But generally it's going to be burning, you know, the, the biomass plant I was talking about in Central Oregon, they were going to burn uh, the slash piles. The slash piles that get burned anyways, I was driving down today, I noticed a lot of smoke of slash piles being burned. All of that energy could have been captured. And that's the idea of, of those biomass plants, is take that to the facility, burn it, and then create the energy out of it. Um, biogas, now that's going to be of less interest as you transition off of natural gas, but there was a, a, a period where biogas was being um, heavily integrated with uh, farms, uh, particularly dairy farms and uh, landfills. There's one just a little north here, the Roseburg landfill has a biogas plant. It's a, like a diesel generator, runs off of the methane produced by the, the landfill. What we are seeing right now is many of those facilities are transitioning away from direct generation and going to renewable natural gas. And so they're converting their plants to take that, that, those gases and convert them into gas that's injected in the natural gas pipelines. Um, there's a facility, for example, just north of Eugene, it was a uh, food waste processing plant. They've converted that to a grass manure plant for uh, renewable natural gas, and so that's being injected right into the natural gas pipeline. I don't know of resources in the Ashland area for that. However, the next one, you guys are in the hot belt, uh, literally in the hot belt of uh, geothermal. I don't know if you've done any studies to see how accessible the geothermal is, but the, the leading geothermal state in the country is, is California, and you are in the vein of heat um, from that same resource. And so geothermal is a dense, very dense form of renewable energy. Um, there is a geothermal plant in OIT campus, about two megawatts, um, direct use for heating. You know, most campuses have, have these generation facilities. Some run off of various resources at, uh, at uh, OIT. They use a two megawatt um, geothermal plant. Good question. Yes. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. Absolutely. You might not know this, how, how much would one of those run? I, I didn't realize that we had the potential for that. I mean, Klamath makes sense given the volcanic activity there, but for some reason, I guess I didn't realize, well, yeah, naturally the San Andreas Falls runs all through here, right. so. We are in the ring of ring of fire right. here. Um, I can't tell you exactly because the cost will be dependent upon how far down you have to go. You have to you have to drill down to get to the resource, but after you have tapped it, it becomes a steam plant. So you think about a steam plant. That's what it is. It's right. a steam plant, and so compact for you know for the level of energy production compared to the land mass required for equivalent generation on say PV or other resources. Um, it is, it's very compact. But in terms of the cost, yeah, it would depend entirely on how far. And, and I, I, what I would say is, starting with an evaluation, if, if there was interest in geothermal, I would start with an evaluation of what are the resources and then bring in a geothermal expert to say, okay, what would that look like and give us some rough estimates on, on the cost. If that bears fruit, then you go to the next step of maybe a request for qualifications and then perhaps an RFP. Um, but that's kind of the process, is start with what are your resources here. What we know is from our limited review for this study, right. you are in a hot bill in an area that could potentially be a, a place for geothermal. Oh. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, and then the last one is wind. You know, the wind, of course, is, is we've, we've had that technology for quite a long time, which is great. And uh, we've, we've been lucky to work with Vestas and others on various projects, which has been, uh, you know, honestly, it's been a delight because it's a neat technology. But you know the challenges of wind in terms of sizing, collector substations, all of those things. And so the, the wind topic, you know, it's, it's more mature, I think, and you probably have already evaluated small versus large and what you can do with that. 
Um, I have long believed that uh, there would be a, a strong, well, w one reason why we have such good wind resource in the Northwest is because we have such good hydro resource in the Northwest. We have the ability to both provide VAR support, uh, so I was going to try to avoid those terminologies, but we have reactive power support that we can get from the, the hydros. In fact, it's to a point, I'll, I'll give you just kind of a big picture on what wind takes, okay? So you have wind, wind farms with generation variability you have to be able to absorb, but they also are oftentimes starving for voltage support on the transmission systems. So you have places like the Dallas Dam, their units, they have a couple of units that they can actually blow the water out of the turbine bay and run the generator as a big motor just to provide voltage support, reactive support for the grids. What they do is they just overexcite this thing as a big motor and it provides a reactive support for the wind farms. A lot of those things that you know we're, we're oblivious to, I guess, as a public are what is the dynamics of running large transmission systems is you get that kind of penetration, you have to provide other support for it. But we also have the benefit up there of a DC-DC converter. So as we get a more and more of that generation, most of that gets just distributed down to LA. They run it down a DC line and we sell it to, to California. All right, so that's all I'm gonna say on, on wind. I think for distributed resources, you probably have uh, some familiar, those are the big pictures on. Um, next would be electric vehicles. But anything else on, on just power sources and distributed energy or renewable energy opportunities? Councillor Hansen. Sure, thank you. Um, I was I was going to wait for the end for the punchline here, but if you want to dig in now, questions as we Absolutely. go. Here we are. So I'm looking back at your, um, it says page 16 on my slide deck. Um, we were looking at the, mm -hmm. at the spring, summer, fall, yeah. winter examples for 1, 5, and 10. And I apologize, I haven't nerded on, on this. Where are the sweet spots for Ashland's utility to aim for if we wanted to produce a net zero profile. Um, maybe we have a, a, you know, a, a battery in the mix too to help smooth things out. Where would an aspirational go, goal take us? Would it be back to the you know, 10 megawatt? I'm, I'm not quite seeing exactly where our, uh, like, assuming we didn't have any more growth in commercial and, and decentral, decentralized generation rooftop stuff, where would the city of Ashland be aiming for for a net zero system? It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. I, I think it, it's, there's a question with a question, which is right. oftentimes it starts with you have, it as, you have a site, you have a specific project, and we would look at, okay, can we integrate that? How would you integrate that? But when the question is, you know, what projects can we integrate to, to meet a goal, it's a very big question. It, and it has so many, um, so many resulting answers. What I would say is there's, there's a deeper part. We can look at these load profiles and say, well, let's just flatten the load. Let's just flatten it to zero. Let's put in enough PV and enough battery that we can control. And if we have excess generation, we just, we waste it, it's fine, but we're gonna flatten it to zero. And we can go through that. We can develop how big a PV system you would need, um, how much it would cost, all those things. But then we're doing it a little bit in a bubble because there's other impacts that you have to consider. For example, what are you gonna do with your utility provider right now, Pacific or and or BPA, right? Are you gonna cut them off? I mean, there's a, this idea that we can just go grid free, right? And that is possible on a small scale, but on a big scale, what happens when the inverter in that big PV system fails? Well, you're gonna need to ask Pacific or BPA to supply power. So a great example of this would be Germany right now, and the impacts they're having from the pipelines being cut off from Russia. So they need additional support to support their renewable portfolio. They are lucky enough to live next door to France, and so they're getting a lot of that support from France via their nuclear power plants. Well, if you have you know, pure PV as an example, what's your contingency? So if you ask Pacific or BPA to provide capacity to back you up, that doesn't come at, at, for free. Right now, as your power agreement is, you have a tier one rate that basically says, here is your baseline load. If you have enough generation to cut into that baseline load, you get to pay for the load 
as well as pay for the generation mm -hmm. because they have to maintain the capacity. When you think about their economics, they have to maintain the transmission systems, the generation capacity to support your load. And so that's kind of the, the, the long answer of it is you can reduce some of it, you can reduce all of it, but what other impacts are there? And it's a much bigger question, hard to answer, you know, in, in this environment without going through all that, going through well, you can imagine what the negotiations with BPA would be. I mean, just trying to get your current, just trying to read your current contract with them. <laughs> you know, if you're having well, trouble sleeping, I recommend it. It will help I, you. I appreciate quickly. the rabbit hole. Um, yeah. You know, we're, we're talking about a hypothetical. Yeah. So just being in the hypothetical realm. I know that, you know, 2028, we have, you know, new contract opportunities, perhaps where there's an ability to push some back. And just, you know, thinking as an aspirational goal, if we want to be a community that wants to aim for net zero, that wants to have mm -hmm. surplus capacity to sell to our neighbors, what would that number be? I'm just curious yeah. because what we land on as a community, um, like say we had um, the ability to install a five megawatt system and we knew that that was X amount of our capacity and, and we were able to get such a good deal on it because of infrastructure money grants and, yeah. and other resources. We were able to lower our bills, perhaps even have um, low income contingency where we just cover that with all of this. The, all these things come into play in addition to grid operating, load stabilization, different circuits and all that engineering cool stuff yeah. that's just fascinating to me. But, but on back in napkin, if we wanted to say, if we wanted to totally go um, net zero with solar, what would our number be and mm -hmm. reverse engineering from that to something that we're at right now, which is like five megawatts of mm -hmm. decentralized generation. And in the middle, just curious, uh, exploring all those options, but seeing yeah. where the where the goalposts are would be helpful. I think the, the most feasible approach would probably be establishing a transmission to, to take your renewable generation outside of your distribution system, not do it inside the distribution system. So have a dedicated, you know, in that respect, you become a power provider. Mm -hmm. A power provider for yourself, selling the power to yourself. Like many communities are already are doing. Yeah. Exactly, but doing it through the transmission system, not through the distribution system. As a distribution system, yeah, we, you can integrate significant amounts. Like, f let's say, for example, you decide, well, we, we've got, what, our peak right now is what, 35 megawatts? Yeah, average. I think our historic high is 44 or something like that. So, you know, mm -hmm. just in terms of big picture, how do I integrate that much? Well, they have these, these distributed energy controllers that you can put in the substation that control your distributed resources. You can integrate PV and geothermal plant and wind plants and integrate all your distributed resources and it will control them to make sure you're not exporting. So it, it will curtail as needed. It will also, they're, they're very sophisticated now. It will also prioritize the best resource, the lowest cost resource in that portfolio. So that's how they're doing it right now in terms of, of controlling it. But that's, again, without consideration for what would be the impacts from the BPA contracts and things of that nature. I, I do think that process, you know, the fact that you are able to, right now to negotiate a contract with potential export is a major advance. Now, if you negotiate a contract for power, if you're wheeling it through their system back to sell it to yourself, that's a lot easier than selling it to BPA. If you sell it to BPA, you're going to have to establish a, a power purchase agreement. And to do that, they're going to need to have some, they're going to have re requirements. You are required to generate this amount, and if you don't, you're going to be penalized. Right? They're looking out for all of their customers. If we're going to buy your power, if you're not available, i got to get it from someplace else. So you better be available, and that's going to be part of your power purchase agreement. So without that, now you're, you're selling it, you're willing it to yourself, you're still in that same situation of if it's down, you're back to, you know, getting power from, from BPA. And so I would say, you know, the, the most feasible is, is definitely transmission interconnect for single point large generation. For a system like this, it would be a distributed generation. You've heard that and you hear, see there's a lot of buzz about distributed generation. Distribute all the resources you can and then have central control for it. I'm going to add one more complexity to that, which is 
in that concept of central control, remember you have a classic distribution system with a lot of overhead lines, all right? You, you know that, you see it, you drive around it, and you wonder, why do we have all those overhead lines? And then you ask the question, Tom, why do we have all those overhead lines? And he says, well, you know how much it would cost to put that underground? And he gives you a number. And you say, okay, now I understand we have all those overhead lines. Right. Well, those are going to add, you know, you've got a lot of faults on those lines. That's why we have reclosers. Reclosers in generation don't work very well together, typically. Um, so we have to consider that. Um, you have to consider the fact that you tie. You tie substations, you try feeders. You have to move these tie points between different substations. So that adds more complexity to your distributed energy controllers. Um, so it is, you can see in, in this analysis, in this study, your question, we can, we can touch on it. We can talk about here's the resources, here's the, the opportunities. But it's a big um, um, problem. And I shouldn't say a problem. Uh, it's not a conundrum. What, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it, it requires a lot of analysis and thinking and looking at what, and that's why I say, here's, here's the opportunities for a resource. I would say the next step is go find what is the most feasible of those resources, start looking at pet projects to develop those resources and building your distributed generation system over a period of time. Well, Does that make sense? Yeah, well, fair enough. I put you on the spot and you're not giving me an answer. So um, I understand this is a study. Uh, at the end of the study, that's definitely something that I would like the community to have their, their heads wrapped around. Mm -hmm. if, we did a, if we did a five kilowatt system on um, 30, or a five megawatt system on 32 acres, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we had the land, we had the substation, how much would that offset? And then we could feed that into our, our different rate analysis and things like that. But this is fascinating. So thank you for entertaining that and I hope to get to that answer when we're done months down the road. That is an answer that we can put in this day, which would be similar to the graph you just saw, the one, I think we did one, five, 10. We can do something similar, and now we can add a couple other elements to it, like, okay, this is just fixed axes, no battery energy storage, yeah. and here's you know, variable axes with battery energy storage kind of concept. And, and yeah, so. and then we start talking about where you know, where in the grid does it become useful for Tom to have um, five megawatts and a battery? Yeah. And, then, and then we can really extrapolate what does it look like to, to sell if we had a contract that it was able to do that. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I can't promise a blueprint. I can't. Um, it's, it's a much more complex thing than that. But we can promise information that will help, I hope. And that, that's our goal is to provide you, and that's what my goal tonight, was to provide you a little more information to help understand the complexities of it and start thinking about what is your next step. So you've got, you've got very high level goals, okay, here's some specifics of what that looks like and ways to get there. But the actual plan is gonna involve a lot of different elements of that. And, it's, and it has to be executed with pragmatic, you know, um, tools. What are the grants? What are the what? What does the land look like? You know, what Absolutely. is the department able to hold, and what kind of infrastructure Absolutely. do we have there? That we, we don't want to, you know, light a bunch of fuses out there. We want to make sure everything works. Absolutely. Properly. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is awesome. Thank you. <laughs> ah, so, Mr. Strutter, do you have any more um, slides, or are we? I'm just about done? there. We're going to go through electric vehicles, but I know we're getting close to time. So let me just yeah. say, your growth has been substantial. It's going to be even more substantial. You can expect. You know, I mean, right now, based on the current growth, you can expect 1,000 EVs in the next four to five years and three to 5,000 in the next 10 years. Uh, that's just happening. We know that's happening. That's our industry. That's where we're going. Um, what is that impact you're going to see? We estimate, depends on the type of chargers. Now, I, I thought I had a graph in here to show you, you know, uh, chargers are like PV. You can have a charger where you plug it in and it charges, or you can have chargers that are smart and actually distribute their charge over the evening into the low load hours when there's less demand and now there's less impact on the grid. That is happening and I think you're gonna find, honestly, I think that's gonna end up ultimately being regulated because you're gonna need that to get the level of penetration of these that we need and uh, maybe even go to the next level which would be not only charging your electric vehicle but being able to generate from your electric vehicle through disturbances. So as we reduce the, the resilience of the grid, use all the generation resources, including electric vehicles, to help support the, the stability of the grid. And so I think that's long-term, that, that is definitely out there years, but that's been talked about. I worked at PNNL 
15 years ago and they had initiatives for that exact system 15 years ago. So it is definitely being thought about and developed. So, so we do have a question, Councillor Kaplan, before we move on from there. Yeah, thank you. It's, a, it's, it's I guess there's connections to a lot of this, uh, the, like the EV demand, but also to uh, kind of along the scale of what Councillor um, Hansen was talking about with new generation. I think about the opportunity for uh, greater energy efficiency. And you threw out a number, I think, if I heard it correctly, was 37 kilowatt hours per ha per household per day. That's, that's, a, that's not... Uh, that's not that low. That's, that's actually, there seems that it lets me think that there's some space there. Yeah. And particularly, you know, knowing our, you know, our infrastructure in, at the household level here in Ashland, I, can, I, I know that there's substantial scope for improved efficiency at the household level with better equipment, with better building envelope. That would also then shrink that, uh, the demand that would be required, open up space for other kinds of uh, alternative uses and save uh, our residents, uh, our households money because currently they're overpaying, uh, well, they're not overpaying, they're, they're paying um, for energy that they're using, but if they don't have to use it, they would pay a lot less. Uh, and they could do that by having uh, higher efficiency equipment and better building envelopes. Are you building in any kind of thoughts or analysis into this plan about what the scope might be and how this electric utility could mm -hmm. prioritize investments uh, in in that sort of uh, technology? We're we, you know we're we're about to embark on a program of low energy uh, um, uh, residential ener uh, residential uh, ener energy efficiency retrofits. So I'd like to see how we could actually take advantage of that program to really to have a both reducing right. energy consumption cost and uh, be strategic for our, our utility. No, I think I understand the question, and, and there is, you know, no question about it. There is opportunity in that, but we are focused on your distribution system, your your utility system, and if there were efficiencies there, we could address those. I, you know, incentive programs are great as you transition off of natural gas to electric. Obviously, that's going to add demand to, to the electric system. So with that should be certain lead level requirements of efficiency on insulation and things of that nature because it is going to add more electric demand. Um, but that's all aside. On the distribution side, there's not a lot available. Uh, you know, increasing the size of conductors will increase their efficiency. But your efficiencies are surprisingly good on distribution equipment, better than people think, mm -hmm. you know. And the biggest game changer in the residential world, I would say, has probably been the transition of lights. We see significant reductions with the lighting um, to, to LEDs. So there's been a substantial reduction in energy usage from that. Um, you can see it in your profile. It's not just because of your EV or your, your PV integration. It is also because things are more efficient and they are growing more efficient um, through market demands. You know, cost of energy is not cheap for anybody, so you want to be more efficient, but also through a lot of regulation, regulation on appliances, regulation on building codes, you name it. Um, in terms of incentive programs, though, um, no, we are not presently addressing incentive programs for residential. You know, um, I will say we are power engineers and we deal with the power equipment and usually that stops at the, the distribution transformer to the house. And then after that, um, you're into residential world. So building code world, things of that nature. So um, it would be great. I mean, it would be nice if we could cover, you know, all the way from transmission down to your utilization equipment, but that's a, that's a big, uh, a lot of electric equipment. Uh, good question, though. And and BPA does have quite a bit of uh, reimbursable conservation programs available to us now, and we can get you that book of what those uh, items are. Yeah, I know I know what's available. I'm looking at the reason, at the opportunity. Uh, yeah. It's not really so much of what the programs are out there, but you know, looking at that 37 kilowatt hours per household per day, and you know. That there's there's opportunity there to bring that down, and that's not just fuel switching. I mean, fuel switching is going to bring it up. That's that's already people using inefficient uh, resistance electric heaters in the winter that are you know costing a fortune. Yes. Yeah. And, and there's another. The, the dynamics of of these things change a lot too. So this next slide shows you what I was talking about earlier, which is delayed charging, controlled charging, and, and demand and responsive charging, and how you can adjust the charging times to mm -hmm. help support exactly. the grid. Now, this used to be 
really important. Um, demand shaving or peak shaving was a really important factor we did. It's less important now. The, the cost, the demand costs versus energy costs, it's changed. And so the rate structures change. But I can tell you just historically, before we had a lot of these initiatives, there were programs out there to do this. And one of them, uh, Milton Free Water is a great example of this because in their control system, they have a three level energy response system. They have incentives for their customers to install radio energy management systems on their hot water heaters and things like that. So when they're in a peak demand period, they shut off hot water heaters. They have a integration with their water system on their reservoir levels. So when they're in a high demand, they reduce the level control on their pumps so the pumps aren't running. And they do voltage reduction. So they do a lot of things to reduce the peak. And so what you see in Milton Free Water is if they get to a peak, it flatlines until you get to the other side and then comes back down. So they basically move the energy requirement to off high peak hours. That largely is gone because the rate structures now don't, don't, don't you know, it's not as important to do that. Um, but that was one example of, of systems that were put in place um, to do that. I don't know of any systems like that to actually reduce the energy. Again, that was delaying energy, right? If you turn off the hot water heater, well, it's just going to run longer when you turn it back on is what's going to happen. So you haven't actually reduced the energy use. All you did was reduce the, the demand. Does that make sense? But that's what this is talking about, though, is when we get to a high level of penetration where, for example, another place where we would run into this would be, let's say that peak was exceeding the capacity of the system, like the transformer capacity, the transmission, capacity, whatever it is. Now we're back into that situation of trying to flatten that out, move that, that demand over. So we're not having to add extra cost to, to increase the capacity of the system. So. Councilor Duquesne, you have a question? Yes, I have a quick question. And thank you so much for your presentation and your wealth of information. Um, honestly, my question is for you, Tom. Um, kind of, Tom perks up, here we go. So um, uh, my question is, and looking at all this information that's been put in front of council this evening, um, when I look at the fiscal impact, currently there is none. It's up to the council to, if we wanted to make some of these additions that have been presented in front of us, that would make the rates go up? Well, m most likely any major capital investment is gonna have a rate impact of some sort. Exactly. Um, so the, you know, my, my view on this when we get to study back is, I'm sure there's gonna be a list of kind of high priority, hey, these are the things that your system needs within the next five years. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna look at those first for investment. And then work with our rate consultant to say, hey, these are the kind of thing, these are the investments that I see we need to make right away. How does that impact our rate? And that's what comes back to you. And that'll come back to us when? Um, well, before we did it. <laughs> I mean, bef uh, you know, it, it's, it's in the future when we, you know, once we have that kind of list and, and can get some budgetary numbers of what those expenditures look like, you know, and. So this is just a, an overview yeah. of um, kind of a, a preview of a more detailed report that will be coming out. Mm -hmm. So that report will list um, where council will need to have a discussion about adding projects potentially in the future to, mm -hmm. you know, a CIP plan, mm -hmm. um, getting cost estimates around that um, to help lay out the future investment that the, the electric system will need. Okay. Well, thank you. And then quickly, Tom, I wanted to thank you for keeping us flat since 2021 with no hikes in our electric. Been working on it. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So if we can go ahead and get through the last couple of slides and see if we can wrap this up this evening. Absolutely, absolutely. So this one is just talking about spe specifically the different types of chargers, their demand and, and the impact on, on your current uh, system. That will be included in the report. The last one is just microgrid. Um, you know, you have one going in. We're, we're going to call it a microgrid. I think microgrid might be a little uh, excessive on this one. You don't quite have enough to totally um, island this system if you needed to. It can't run itself enough power to, to run a portion of it. Um, but, you know, great opportunity to get grant money. And I, I'd say these are, are definitely, um, you know, in, in terms of your question, the go after every grant you can get and install every one of these you can do. You got roofs, put, you know, utilize your roofs, absolutely, um, wherever you can. 
Um, and, and the impacts of that, I think for the most part, at least for the, the foreseeable future, we can deal with those in the electric department in terms of settings, regulations, things of that nature. When we start getting into the big ones, you're starting to talk bigger impacts, and certainly we start talking net zero, you know, much bigger impacts. But these ones are, are ready, and they're happening, and it's, it's great to see. Um, I think that's really it, unless there's any questions. I, I want to get back to your point, which is absolutely our report will prioritize our recommendations. We're looking for, first and foremost, safety of your system. And I hate to say it, there's a competing interest out there, as you know, um, the fire mitigation plan. You know, you are in a, in a hotbed in some areas, and that's a big deal right now. And so there'll be priorities for fire mitigation and improvements you need to do for that, based on that study. Um, next thing is reliability. You know, we, we, we are very blessed in this country to have such reliable utility services. We also know it's a necessary thing. You can't turn off people's power for long periods of time. So we want to make sure the grid is reliable, your distribution system is reliable. And then above that, we'll look at opportunities, if we can, for meeting some of your other objectives, such as, as your, uh, your net zero objective. So. Councillor Kaplan. Yeah, thank you. Could you just back up one slide that we Absolutely. just lost over super quickly? Yep. The last the last set of bullets, the city may want to consider additional efforts on public education and dynamic rate structure. Could you walk us through those two two items for a sec? Yeah, um, so, you know, public education was exactly what we were talking about, efficiency, you know, using the public as, part, you know, the chargers. You wouldn't have to necessarily have demand responsive chargers if the public was, it's hard to get them out of habits, but if they know everybody comes home at 5 p.m. and plugs in their, their electric vehicle, there's going to be an impact on the grid. So there are things that the public can do to help support that, to, to move those peaks around. Um, in terms of you know the, the question of, of dynamic rate structure, that is mostly around, and th that was a big push again a few years ago when we were really looking at the difference between high load hours and low load hours, and there was gonna be a much finer resolution on that. So your rate structure was based on the time of use, high load hours in the daytime, low load hours in the evening, because generation in the evening was cheaper than in the, in the daytime when we're in the peaks, when the generation is very high. The way the, the, the transmission providers work is, they have baseline generation, which is very low cost. And as demand exceeds that, they go to the next level, and then they go to the peakers. And the peakers are going to be your gas turbine plants, things like that. They run one hour a day and make just as much money, if not more money, than the power plant that ran 24 hours a day. Because that one hour of power is so expensive because of that peak. And so that cost is passed on to the ratepayers to low load, high load hours. And so there was a real big push for um, doing a dynamic rate structure to incentivize people to run their laundry at night and not during the peak hours, to run their electric demands in off high load hours. So if you knew, if I run a load of laundry right now or if I cook my dinner right now, it'll cost me three times as much as if I wait an hour, you'll wait an hour, right? So, That's so, the idea. So yeah, I understand what it is, um, but you put it in there as something the city may want to consider additional efforts on, and now you're saying, well, it was something a few years ago and not so much. Is it something that we should be considering additional efforts on, or is it not something that we should I wouldn't consider? say it's not something to consider. I'd say it's not as fruitful as it was um, just a few years ago. Now, I, I, it just depends on where this portfolio goes. It depends on what the ability of the transmission providers to continue to provide. I mean, they've changed their rate structures a lot. Well, I, I would ask, Tom will know better than anybody else, how much has BPA changed their rate structure in the tier programs and things like that over the last 10 years, would you say? The, the, the calculations have changed considerably, especially around demand. And now demand is a moving charge. It, the demand charge changes every month at this point. So, you know, when they've got lots of water, you know, springtime demand, is five dollars a kW or a megawatt or something like that, and then you know later in the uh, fall time when the water when there's no water water really our our demand charges go up to ten dollars or eleven dollars. So it it really is kind of a mm -hmm. tough one to chase, and it, for to be impactful in a small system as ours, the last time we looked at it through rate design, the cost. In the investment in the metering infrastructure and stuff to do a time of use rate, we couldn't ever ROI it with our demands. That, that's just the way it looked on paper. And let me say, let, let we, I'll put this as a note for ourselves to better address that in the report under today's conditions. But 
my my uh, warning is more of we used to do this thing where we would look at your system and look for 0.95 power factor. Anytime you were exceeding 0.95 power factor, let's look at ways to provide power factor capacitors to get above 0.95 because you were getting a ratchet charge, you were getting a, a demand charge from that, a, a VAR charge. And then that changed to 0.97, got even more restricted, more and more and more. And now with the new structure, all those things that we were doing aren't quite as applicable as they used to be. It's not saying that it went away, it's just saying we had spent a lot of time and effort to, to address that structure and then it changed. So if we're gonna look at this, we should look at not only what it is now, but try to forecast where it's gonna be as it grows. So if you're gonna invest in it, you know, you wanna make sure that investment's gonna return over a longer period than you know, BPA's change in, in rate structures. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, it does, thank you. Councillor Hanson. Thanks, Mayor. Um, two ending thoughts from me. Uh, Pacific Power raised their rates 11% last year and 15% this year. Yes, thank you, City of Ashland, for not raising our electric rates in the last three years. Are we going to have to play catch up? Is this is this where we're heading now with with eight to 10% inflation this last year for Oregonians? Uh, looking at looking at the numbers, no, we we've made some good moves, um, especially with the BPA contract negotiations I did last year that got us all the the money back on our bills right. has really saved us. So where where we go from here is after this study's done and we kind of look at some of the capital spending, that's when we'll bring, to Don, I don't remember if you were here when uh, Don Lund from Utility Financial Solutions presented, we'll bring Don back to uh, look at that and, and integrate it into our current rates and what that looks like. But 10% uh, no, 4% maybe, but okay. for a year or so. And it'll, it'll depend on that capital list. Uh, yeah, how aggressive we want to get on the capital spend. Okay. Yeah. Great. And and I would be remiss if I didn't say another part of this um, our curiosity is um, is just natural disaster prevention. Being that we own our own utility and, and at least one of our substations, correct me if I'm wrong, is at the end of the grid, the, the mountain avenue. What would happen if those if those feeders were just get, you know, burned up and or or severed in an earthquake? Just worst case scenario, what what would our community really benefit from strategically in one or two um, uh, government um, microgrids, uh, you know, city-owned microgrids? Well, you know, just like something beyond what we've uh, identified in this as our next project, but some more aspirational goals for survival, given that we have all this incredible infrastructure here and this amazing um, yeah. electric department. So yeah. in addition to the net zero, I, I would I would love to know, like, as you were looking at this through that lens, what you think we should strategize for. Yeah, and we, we do try very hard to look at contingencies, look at natural disasters, whatever they are, um, you know, as much as we can. But it is, as you know, it's very hard to, to foresee what those are going to be. But we do try to look at specifically, you know, loss of that transport, loss of that line, loss of this. What is the contingency plan, and do you have the capacity to handle that? So you don't have to do, you know, you see what happens when they don't have the capacity. You get rolling blackouts. That's that is what that is. Right. You know, there's insufficient capacity to handle the situation. You're gonna have rolling blackouts. Well, you know, right now we want to make sure you have that capacity as much as you can, or at least identify where you don't and how to invest in that to make sure you do. So. This is amazing work. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd just like to follow on behind Councillor Hansen's question, and that is, as this relates to emergency management, there's a clear tie between our uh, production and storage and what we can do in an emergency. And so is there a, is there a connection being made across departments in, in this regard where when we come, when this comes back to us, we'd be looking not only at how and where can we generate um, uh, renewable energy, but but also what makes sense in terms of these microgrids, these resilient structures. Should we be looking at our wastewater treatment facility and, or or water treatment facility or wherever, and and ratcheting up the production around some of those critical utility systems? Is that will we will that be part of the conversation when this comes back to us? Not so much. They they have their own um, criteria. Field. You'll you'll notice your your water treatment facilities, your wastewater treatment facilities have backup generators specifically for that. They have to have that. Um, and so your you know well pumps, things like that, almost always your lift stations. I mean, the last thing you want is a lift station to to overflow. They'll all have backup generation now. 
Granted, right now, it's going to be a diesel or a gas fired or something of, those, of that nature. Is the opportunity to transfer that to a battery storage potentially? But right now, I can tell you, you know, I'm going through the grant process for backup generators for a utility in Springfield, and they are diesel generators. So the grants that are available for them right now aren't, aren't battery storage. It's, it's diesel generators right now. Um, maybe in the future we'll find you know better opportunities for doing that with a battery storage and maybe a distributed generation type facility. But uh, right now it is still diesel because those are absolutely critical infrastructure. You got to have water, you got to have wastewater, and you certainly got to have lift stations. You can't have those things overflowing. So yeah. So Mayor, to speak to your to your point, um, staff is constantly you know having tabletops about emergency disaster and I think um, updating our emergency operations plan that's a good chance to further explore where we may have some weak points that we need to shore up but that is a, a separate study potentially great so I think we are good for the evening yes Thank you so much, Mr. Stoddard, you and your team for coming and helping us understand. Uh, I know that this has been a long time coming that we've been looking to really dig into this conversation. So thank you so much and thank you, Tom. Thank you. Uh, and uh, with that, I will adjourn the meeting. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.